In the once majestic Rose Castle, now reduced to a smoldering ruin, the air is filled with screams and the stench of blood. The proud Ragnar clan's members, servants, and workers lie scattered, slaughtered mercilessly. Amid this chaos, a lone figure stands, Theo, the young lord of the Ragnar clan. He fights desperately, trying to fend off the mysterious faction responsible for this devastation, unaware of which rival house has betrayed his family. Before we dive deeper into this brutal battle, let's take a step back. The Ragnar clan is no ordinary family. For over a thousand years, they've served as the empire's northern shield, protecting its borders at the edge of the continent. This family's strength comes from their unique lineage, rumored to descend from dragons. Every Ragnar is born with extraordinary magical powers, stamina, and unmatched swordsmanship. That is, every Ragnar but one. Our protagonist, Theo, the so-called bastard heir of the Ragnar clan. Unlike his kin, Theo was not blessed with the talents that define his family. But that doesn't stop him from giving his all. And now, in the ruins of his ancestral home, Theo's opponent stands before him, a man cloaked in betrayal. This traitor is none other than his own swordsman tutor, the person he trusted most, Master Rendon. Theo's eyes widen in disbelief as Rendon pulls off his mask, revealing the face of his betrayer. Mocking Theo with every word, Rendon sneers, calling him a talentless fool, a disgrace to the prestigious Ragnar name. He watched Theo struggle every morning, training harder than anyone else, yet never getting anywhere. Rendon laughs cruelly, telling Theo his efforts were always in vain. Anger bubbles up in Theo, who can only grit his teeth as the insults keep coming. Gathering what little strength he has left, Theo lashes out, accusing Rendon of betraying him after all those years of teaching him useless techniques. But before Theo can even finish, Rendon's sword flashes, swift and merciless. With one clean strike, Theo's arm is severed. His scream pierces the air as blood splatters the battlefield. Weak, he falls to the ground, his strength draining fast. Rendon isn't finished. Grabbing Theo by the hair, he lifts him up, forcing him to witness the burning ruins of Rose Castle. Look at what you've caused, Rendon snarls. He tells Theo that all the destruction, the death of his family, rests on his shoulders. Why? Because he's a talentless failure. As if that wasn't enough, another figure approaches, dragging a lifeless body, Theo's mother. She's thrown in front of him, her eyes empty, her body cold. Rendon twists the knife further, telling Theo that even his mother's death is his fault. He's the reason she's nothing more than a corpse. Overwhelmed by grief, Theo can barely stand, but he makes one last desperate attempt. With all the strength he has left, he grabs his sword and charges at Rendon, his mind filled with rage. But before he can reach him, a sword whizzes through the air and pierces Theo's gut, launching him several meters away. The one who threw the sword, another enemy, looks annoyed. Just finish him off already, he grumbles. Rendon, chuckling, apologizes to his companion. I was just taking my disciple for a stroll down memory lane, he says with a grin. As Theo lies bleeding out, his vision begins to blur. The world around him starts to fade, and with his final thoughts, he reflects on his pitiful death. He regrets not having the talent to protect his family, to save his mother, to live up to the Ragnar name. Everything he fought for, gone. Darkness consumes him. But this isn't the end. Just as the light leaves his eyes, a sudden system window appears before Theo. A cold, emotionless voice announces that his death has triggered a special trait. The world around him shudders, and the system informs him that he will be sent back to a critical moment, a regression point, this time with a newfound power. And with that, Theo's story truly begins. Theo opens his eyes, disoriented. The first thing he sees is the last person he ever wanted to see again, Rendon, his treacherous instructor. They're in the middle of sword training, just like the old days. Rendon, ever the strict teacher, snaps at Theo for daydreaming, but Theo is frozen, confused. His mind is racing. Is this a flashback? It can't be. The face he never wanted to see again, the one that betrayed him, now stares back at him like nothing ever happened. It feels like some cruel cosmic joke. Suddenly, a system window appears in front of Theo, and he's completely clueless about what's going on. The message? Punch Rendon in the face. Part of a tutorial quest. Theo has no idea why or how this is happening, and what's weirder is that Rendon can't see the system window. With a mix of disbelief and irritation, 
Theo decides he's not going to question it. He drops his training stick, balls his fist, and without warning, delivers a solid punch right into Rendon's smug face. To Theo's surprise, Rendon barely reacts, his face completely blank as if Theo's punch was nothing more than a joke. Our boy, though, is inwardly smirking, thinking about how real this so-called flashback feels. But his satisfaction is short-lived. Rendon, now angry, retaliates with a vicious strike, sending Theo crashing to the ground. As the pain floods his senses, Theo is annoyed. Do I seriously have to endure pain in my flashbacks, too? Rendon sighs, completely missing the point of Theo's outburst. He assumes it's all because Theo is frustrated about the upcoming awakening ceremony, a huge event where the members of the Ragnar clan unlock their true power. Rendon explains he understands why Theo's struggling, but he won't forgive a student who lashes out at their master. Then he just walks away, leaving Theo on the ground. At the mention of the awakening ceremony, Theo's eyes widen. That ceremony happened 10 years ago. Now it's all starting to click. As Rendon leaves and the other clan members snicker, mocking him like they always do, Theo begins to process everything. The ground beneath him feels real. The injury, the stinging pain, it's all real. This isn't a flashback, he realizes. I've actually come back in time. He's 17 years old again, reliving a moment from 10 years before his death. Right on cue, another system window pops up, congratulating him for completing the tutorial quest. His reward? Ragnar's talent has been activated. The system asks if he wants to receive it. Without hesitation, Theo hits yes. Immediately, a surge of arcane energy erupts in his chest, and the system confirms his stats are going to increase at an insane rate. For the first time in his life, Theo feels a glimmer of hope. Meanwhile, back in the Rose Palace, we cut to that filthy traitor, Rendon, having tea with Theo's mother, Lady Cecilia Ragnar. He's busy reporting to her about Theo's progress, though he's not exactly kind with his words. Rendon sneers, telling her that her son is the most talentless student he's ever seen. But with a broad, fake grin, he assures Cecilia that this is exactly why he is here to whip Theo in a shape before the awakening ceremony, which is now only five months away. Lady Cecilia, with her usual grace, smiles warmly and hands over a heavy bag of gold coins, telling Rendon to give Theo a bit of extra attention. Rendon eagerly accepts the money, trying to reassure her that she has nothing to worry about. But Cecilia's response is calm and firm. She's not worried. She believes in her son, Theo, with all her heart. We cut to Rendon smugly strolling down the castle corridor, a hefty bag of gold swinging in his hand. He grins to himself, pleased with the easy money he's earning. He's being paid handsomely to teach Theo absolutely nothing. As he walks, he chuckles at how both mother and son are complete fools. Not only is he training the direct heir of the Ragnar clan without lifting a finger, but he's also being rewarded by his real master for leaking Theo's secrets and sabotaging his progress. It's a dream opportunity for this traitor. Betrayal never felt so sweet. As he walks, Theo zooms past him at full speed, sprinting down the corridor. Rendon barely glances at him, scoffing under his breath, calling Theo an idiotic loser as he watches him dash away. But Theo's not running aimlessly. He's rushing to see his mother. When he finally reaches her, he calls out to her, gasping for breath. As she turns to face him, Theo can't hold back. Without saying a word, he embraces her tightly and bursts into tears. For the first time, it truly hits him. He's really back, ten years into the past. The painful memory of Rendon forcing him to watch his mother's lifeless body flashes in his mind. But now, feeling her warmth, hearing her voice, Theo is overwhelmed with happiness. Seeing her alive again fuels his resolve. He swears to himself that this time, things will be different. This time, he'll change the future for her sake. And with the mysterious system backing him and his Ragnar talent awakened, he's sure he'll become powerful enough to face the war for the throne head on. Most importantly, he's determined to take revenge on that piece of garbage, Rendon. Just as his thoughts solidify, the system delivers his next tutorial quest. Train your body to the limit. It's still the crack of dawn. The sun hasn't even risen yet, but Theo is already hard at work. Fueled by thoughts of revenge and a burning desire to protect his mother, he pushes himself harder than ever before. In his previous life, he was part of the intelligence agency, Black Word, but was always stuck in the background due to his lack of combat skills. Now, with the Ragnar talent, everything is different. He recalls critical pieces of information he had gathered, 
like the secret elixirs and manuals he never expected to use. One thing stands out. The Bloody Sword Emperor Elixir, a potion that enhances the body's strength to terrifying levels. More than anything, he remembers the extreme training methods he once abandoned, believing he didn't have the talent to endure them. But now, now he's sure he can unlock his true potential. As he runs laps around the training hall, he feels his speed increasing. His body is responding to the intense training, and the system window is there to show his progress. Other clan members watch in disbelief, whispering amongst themselves. Has Theo always been this fit? Every day, he swings his sword faster and stronger than the day before. His confidence grows with each passing hour. A few days later, we find Theo training late into the night, long after everyone else has gone to bed. He's been pushing his body relentlessly with barely any sleep. Enter Evelyn, the manager of the training grounds, who yawns as she watches him. She's starting to wonder if this so-called talentless fool might not be as useless as everyone thinks. She can't help but feel intrigued. Meanwhile, Theo is on the verge of collapse. His body screams in exhaustion, but his determination is unshakable. He's fixated on that progress bar, watching it edge closer and closer to 100%. Just last night, he hit 90%, but the moment he rested, it dipped back down to 89%. That's why he's pushing himself beyond his limits. No rest, no slowing down. Now he's hit 98%, and he knows he's almost there. With every ounce of strength he has left, he picks up speed, determined to reach the goal. His muscles ache, his breath is ragged, but he refuses to stop. Finally, he does it. The progress bar reaches 100%, exhausted and barely able to stand. Theo collapses to the ground, but the system immediately congratulates him for completing the tutorial quest. His reward? The Dragon Heart, a rare and powerful ability that will increase his strength beyond anything he ever imagined. But before Theo can bask in the details of his reward, he faints from pure exhaustion. As he lies there, barely conscious, the system hovers over him, asking if he wants to receive the reward now. With a trembling hand, Theo manages to press the yes button. Suddenly, a brilliant blue light engulfs him, filling the training hall. Evelyn, standing nearby, watches in complete disbelief as Theo's body undergoes a miraculous transformation. A while later, we find Theo waking up in a quiet room. As he opens his eyes and looks around, Evelyn appears at his bedside. She reassures him that he's in the break room of training ground four, reminding him there was no need to push himself so hard. Theo recognizes her immediately, which takes her by surprise. She formally introduces herself as Evelyn Neville, the manager of the fourth training ground, and explains that he lost consciousness while training alone earlier that morning, so she brought him here to rest. Theo thanks her for the kindness, and she offers him some water. As he drinks, Evelyn's tone shifts slightly as she reminds him of an important rule within the Ragnar clan. Opening one's mana hall before the official awakening ceremony is strictly forbidden. Theo blinks confused. He nods along, saying he knows about the rule, but has no idea why she's bringing it up. That's when Evelyn's expression hardens, and with a menacing look, she asks him point blank, then why did you break it? Caught off guard, Theo stumbles over his words, asking why she's questioning him like this. Evelyn narrows her eyes and explains that right before he passed out, she felt a powerful mana wave, one that perfectly matched the opening of a mana hall. She demands to know if Theo had opened his mana hall without authorization. Theo is completely clueless at first, but then it hits him. He remembers the moment just before he collapsed, the reward he received from the system for completing his tutorial quest. He had been granted a dragon heart, along with the magic power of ten past lives. He's at a total loss for words. A dragon heart is no ordinary prize. You see, a dragon heart is incredibly special because it allows a mana hall, the core of a warrior's power, to be placed directly inside it. Normally, humans place their mana halls in their lower abdomen because the heart can't handle that kind of raw energy. But with a dragon heart, the mana hall can operate far more efficiently, granting overwhelming power. In the Ragnar clan, every warrior dreams of obtaining a dragon heart, as it's the fastest way to ascend to immense strength. But no human has ever overcome the natural limitations of their heart to use one. Until now. Theo realizes the gravity of his situation. Sure, he's received an incredible reward, but it's also put him in a dangerous position. Especially with Evelyn Neville standing in front of him, a high-ranking swordswoman who once commanded the elite white armored dragon cavalry. Her skills were so feared, even a demon dragon revered her. 
But more than her skill, Evelyn was known for her unyielding principles. She was the type who couldn't tolerate dishonesty or cowardice, something Theo knows too well. Years ago, she was briefly his direct master, but when she found him lacking, she relinquished the role. Theo knows that if Evelyn discovers his secret, that he's received a dragon heart and has opened his mana hall, he might lose his head. But instead of panicking, Theo smiles. He's already got a plan in mind. As long as he doesn't get caught, he's safe. With a smirk, he makes a sassy comeback to Evelyn's accusations, questioning how she can accuse him of opening his mana hall without any real proof. Are you really willing to execute me just based on your gut feeling? He challenges. Evelyn falls silent, momentarily stunned by his confidence. Theo doesn't stop there. He presses further, reminding her that he is still an heir of the Ragnar clan. If word got out that she falsely accused him of breaking clan rules, it would be seen as defiling the Ragnar name. You know the punishment for humiliating an heir, don't you? He adds, his voice laced with menace. Evelyn, unfazed by his threats, calmly replies, execution. Theo nods, satisfied that she understands. He warns her to think carefully before she speaks again. Evelyn is taken aback. Is this really the same timid boy I knew? She wonders. Something has definitely changed about him, and it's not just his attitude. She's sure she felt that mana wave. She's certain he opened his mana hall. Despite Theo's threatening words, Evelyn is determined to investigate further. Even if he's a Ragnar, rules are rules, and she won't let him get away if he broke them. But as she probes deeper, something strange happens. After a thorough examination, she realizes there's no mana hall in Theo's body. Her expression falls as the truth sinks in. She was wrong. Meanwhile, Theo, feeling smug, crosses his arms and raises an eyebrow. Satisfied now? He asks, his voice dripping with confidence. Evelyn, bound by the rules and her sense of honor, kneels at Theo's feet without hesitation. She bows her head lower and lower, asking him to execute her, ready to pay for her sins with her life. The weight of her words hangs in the air as she waits for Theo's judgment. But instead of taking her life, Theo reveals something only the audience can hear, the nature of the dragon heart. Unlike ordinary mana halls, a dragon heart is far more powerful and unique. It allows its user to control and hide their mana at will. And since the fact that humans can possess a dragon heart won't be discovered for years, Theo is confident no one can accuse him of having one. Instead of delivering the execution Evelyn expects, Theo places a reassuring hand on her back. With a calm voice, he tells her there's no need for such drastic actions. As he walks away, he praises her righteousness, acknowledging that few would risk their lives to demand the truth from an heir. But in reality, Theo has his own reasons for sparing her. He knows Evelyn is one of the strongest warriors around, and keeping her alive could prove beneficial in the long run. He then casually explains to her that the restriction on opening mana halls before the awakening ceremony exists to prevent mana overflow. He finds it amusing that she's so concerned about him, a mere bastard of the Ragnar clan, but he appreciates her principles. And with that, Theo leaves her sitting there in stunned silence. He walks away confidently, feeling on top of the world. Not only does he have the dragon heart, but he's also gained 10 years worth of magic power from his previous life. With these newfound abilities, his future looks brighter than ever. A few days later, we're back to seeing Theo in training, dealing with the same insufferable instructor, Rendon. This bastard keeps yelling at him, telling him to adjust his sword swings. Theo plays along, pretending to be weak, though it's getting harder to endure Rendon's constant insults. But Theo's sharp eyes pick up on something. Rendon isn't just incompetent, he's subtly teaching Theo weird, ineffective sword techniques. It's becoming clearer to Theo that Rendon is following orders from a mastermind. The pieces start to fall into place, someone higher up is pulling the strings. Theo remembers the moment of his death in his previous life, and he's convinced the one who delivered the final blow must be the real mastermind. With a sly grin, Theo decides it's time to act. He needs to provoke Rendon into making a move, either to quit or to reveal the mastermind. Rendon's nagging reaches a peak, and Theo snaps the training stick he's holding in two. Turning to Rendon, Theo finally speaks his mind, telling him bluntly that his lessons are utter garbage. The look on Rendon's face is priceless. Theo's not done. He mocks Rendon, asking how someone with such trash skills even managed to become a mid-rank swordsman. Theo takes it further, taunting that Rendon would probably struggle against even low-level demonic beasts. Rendon takes the bait. 
He's fuming with rage, but Theo doesn't back down. He steps forward, looking Rendon in the eye, and makes it clear. His swordsmanship is pathetic. We soon learn that Theo's true goal is to push Rendon over the edge, forcing him to resign from his position. And if Rendon does run to his mysterious benefactor, Theo will finally find out who's been pulling the strings behind the scenes. The scene shifts to Camellia Palace, where a man bursts into a pub with an excited grin on his face. He calls out to someone named Axion, loudly announcing to everyone that the bastard of Ragnar, Theo, will be dueling his master next week. The man, clearly thrilled, starts bragging about how Theo is blaming his instructor for his lack of talent and is convinced Theo will be left permanently disabled after the duel. But Axion, sitting quietly in the corner, doesn't share the man's excitement. His silence is tense, and without warning, the glass in his hand smashes into the loud guy's face, knocking him out cold with a single blow. Axion, clearly annoyed, makes it clear that he doesn't care whether a bastard like Theo ends up half disabled. Why would he? He's just another Ragnar after all. Specifically, one of the four hounds of the north, known as the Dark Tiger Axion Ragnar. Standing beside him is Remington, another of the four hounds, known as the Silver Lion. Just then, another man strides into the pub, Ed Trevion, also known as the Nine Dragon Sky Dragon. Ed looks particularly worried, warning the others that things could go wrong if they let their guard down. But Axion, still annoyed, brushes off his concern. That's true only for people with talent, he says coldly. We don't need to worry about Theo. He's just a muddle-headed nobody. D, ever cautious, points out that with the Ragnar clan, even the slightest possibility can lead to something unprecedented. Axion dismisses the concern, believing that Theo messing with Rendon is actually a good thing. His instructor should be more than capable of handling the so-called bastard. But a week later, the situation escalates far beyond anyone's expectations. At training ground four, the atmosphere is tense. It's not just the usual clan members in attendance. Big shots from across the region have gathered to witness this unexpected duel. Theo stands in the middle of the arena, visibly anxious under the piercing gazes of hundreds of spectators. He curses himself, recalling how he just wanted to get Rendon fired after being humiliated, but things spiraled out of control fast. Still, he isn't too worried. This was bound to happen eventually, and he's fired up to take revenge on Rendon. The system notification confirms his next task, third tutorial quest, fight Rendon and win. As Theo takes a deep breath, the memory of how this duel was set into motion flashes through his mind. We cut to the moment when Theo confronted Rendon, calling out his pathetic swordsmanship and bluntly firing him. You're done. Get lost, Theo had said, but Rendon, desperate, protested that his contract wasn't over yet. Theo shot back, reminding him that since he was fired by the employer, Theo himself, there was nothing left to discuss. Theo would have loved to punch Rendon right then and there, but doubt still lingered in his mind about his ability to take this guy down. For Rendon, this was a disaster. He couldn't afford to be fired. He hadn't completed his true mission yet. As he stepped closer to Theo, trying to convince him otherwise, a system window flashed before Theo's eyes. Fight and win against Rendon. It caught Theo completely off guard. Before he could react, Evelyn Neville stepped in, suggesting they settle this the Ragnar way, through a sword match, letting strength decide the outcome. A duel would eliminate the need for any tribunal. Everything would be decided by the sword, following the will of the victor. Sensing an opportunity, Rendon quickly agreed to the duel, eager to resolve things on his terms. Theo, meanwhile, was left unsure. He wasn't ready to face Rendon in a real fight. But with the pressure mounting and Evelyn insisting it was the best course of action, Theo found himself with no choice but to agree. Now, standing face to face with Rendon, Theo could hear the whispers of the crowd. They mocked him, smirking as they gossiped about how pathetic the bastard of the Ragnar clan was. They were convinced he didn't even know how to properly swing a sword and fully expected him to leave the arena crippled. To them, there was no way Theo, an apprentice swordsman, could possibly defeat a mid-ranked fighter like Rendon. Rendon, brimming with arrogance, tells Theo that if he apologizes now, he'll pretend nothing happened. There's no need to throw your life away over your pride, he sneers. But Theo, always quick with the sass, fires back. Maybe you should apologize, Rendon, he says, voice laced with confidence. Unless you want to end up a one-armed swordsman, I suggest you quietly accept that you've been fired. Rendon simply grins, his mind already set on how this duel would end. To him, this was the perfect opportunity to accidentally kill Theo under the guise of an official match. 
As the fight begins, he mockingly invites Theo to take the first strike. With a determined shout, Theo charges forward, sword raised. The crowd is stunned as they watch Theo rush recklessly toward his opponent, clearly lacking any proper form or technique. They murmur among themselves, certain this will be over in moments. Rendon smirks, easily blocking Theo's attack and delivering a series of sword strikes in return. But much to his surprise, Theo manages to defend himself, albeit clumsily. The battle continues as Rendon keeps swinging, pushing Theo back with every strike. In his mind, this outcome is inevitable. Theo is still nothing more than an apprentice, barely a swordsman at all. Rendon's confidence grows as he corners Theo, his sword strikes coming down harder and faster. As the crowd watches, Rendon can't help but think that Theo may have improved slightly, but it's nowhere near enough to pose a threat. If Theo were at the level of the Four Hounds of the North, it might have been a different story. But to Rendon, there's no way this imbecile from the Ragnar clan could ever hope to defeat him. The scene shifts to a few days earlier, where Theo, looking bewildered, turns to Evelyn and asks, what were you thinking when you suggested that match? Evelyn, ever calm, simply replies that she was trying to help him. She explains that if Theo really wants to get rid of Rendon, he needs to be more strategic about it. Firing him isn't enough. She believes that Rendon has someone powerful backing him up. Theo, curious, asks how she knows this, and Evelyn reveals that it was obvious because Rendon had been teaching him a bizarre, inefficient sword style. She even had someone secretly investigate him. Theo is caught off guard by her revelation. In his past life, Evelyn never bothered to expose Rendon, but now she's digging into the mystery, just because he piqued her interest after the whole Mana Hall incident. Evelyn's investigation uncovered that all of Rendon's actions trace back to Camellia Palace. While this isn't entirely surprising to Theo, it irritates him to realize that all this chaos is yet another part of the miserable war for the throne. Quickly brushing aside his annoyance, Theo remarks, I'm surprised you figured this much out. He confesses that with his current skills, he's not confident he can beat Rendon yet. Evelyn, however, offers him a smirk and reassures him. You can beat him. Stop underestimating yourself, she says with unwavering confidence. Back in the present, the duel rages on. Rendon, relentless, throws blow after blow, but Theo blocks and counters each one effortlessly, as if it's nothing. The tables have completely turned. Rendon, once sure of his dominance, is now the one struggling. As the fight continues, he starts to question what's happening. This isn't the same Theo Ragnar he knew. Something has drastically changed. The crowd, too, senses it. Whispers ripple through the spectators as they watch, stunned by Theo's unexpected prowess. Meanwhile, off to the side, Remington watches from beneath his hood, while Evelyn, watching with pride, enjoys the spectacle. We flash back to the week before the duel, and it's revealed that Evelyn is the one who personally trained Theo. It turns out she bent the rules to help him, even though technically it's forbidden. But she didn't care. Rendon wasn't fit to be a teacher anyway. Theo can't help but smirk at this revelation, feeling a rush of excitement and satisfaction. Having Evelyn in his debt was proving to be worth it after all. However, one thing nags at him. Why is she going so far to help him? He asks her outright, wondering if it's all because of what happened with the Mana Hall incident. Evelyn admits that played a part, but there's more to it. She mentions there's someone she knows who would be interested in Theo, someone obsessed with collecting talented individuals. Theo takes note of that, filing it away for later. Back in the present, the battle intensifies. Rendon, growing desperate, starts to wonder if Theo has been faking his weakness all this time, acting like a fool just to lower everyone's expectations. Mid-fight, Theo suddenly asks, who's backing you? Rendon freezes, his face twisting in confusion and anger. What are you talking about, he snaps. But Theo presses on, casually reminding him that he knows Rendon has been teaching him useless sword techniques on purpose. He finally gets blunt, asking if Rendon is working with Camellia Palace. The moment of silence that follows confirms Theo's suspicions. The truth is written all over the old man's face. Seizing the opportunity, Theo swings his sword, and in a flash, he slices through Rendon's hand. The severed hand flies through the air, and the crowd gasps, completely stunned. Rendon lets out a howl of pain, clutching the stump where his hand used to be. He stumbles, cursing under his breath, while blood splatters across the arena. Theo, feeling a surge of confidence, strides toward his defeated foe. As he stands over Rendon, Theo recalls the painful words this man once said to him in his previous life. 
that Theo was a weak, talentless fool and that everything was his fault. Now, with a menacing swing of his sword, Theo throws those same words back in Rendon's face. You're the weakest one here, he growls, reminding Rendon that in the Ragnar clan, the rule of the strong is absolute. Someone as weak as you shouldn't have come here in the first place. With one final, powerful strike, Theo's sword comes down, severing Rendon's head clean from his body. The crowd watches in shock as Rendon's head rolls across the ground, blood pooling beneath him. The arena falls into a stunned silence as everyone processes what just happened. And then, just as expected, a system window pops up, congratulating Theo for successfully completing Tutorial Quest 3. Not only did he win the fight, but he exceeded the objective, earning a bonus reward. The system asks if he'd like to receive his reward now, and without hesitation, Theo hits yes. The crowd? Yeah, they've officially lost it. It's mind-blowing to see our boy, a total apprentice swordsman, just slice through a mid-tier swordsman like it's nothing. Meanwhile, our guy, yeah, the one you're rooting for, he's standing there completely underwhelmed like this old bastard. This is the guy I was sweating over in my past life. He's embarrassed, feeling like he shouldn't have ever been scared of this dude. But hey, life's different this time around, right? Then the system drops the bombshell. It announces that the ability called Observation has been activated as a reward. Oh, and to sweeten the deal, he's also gained a year's worth of magic power. That's when things go from crazy to absolute chaos. Boom! Suddenly, a guy crashes down from the sky like a goddamn meteor, slamming into the ground with enough force to wreck the place. Before Theo can even process what's happening, this guy's already yelling his name, Theo. And oh man, he's grinning like a madman. Who is it? None other than Julius Ragnar, the demon dragon and commander of the White Armored Dragon Cavalry. Yeah, that Julius Ragnar. Theo is stunned, completely frozen. He can't believe it. How long has this guy been watching him? Meanwhile, the crowd, they're going absolutely insane, trying to figure out why someone of Julius' rank is even here. They're like, isn't this the dude Evelyn mentioned? The one who's obsessed with collecting talent. And speaking of Evelyn, oh man, she's devastated. The commander has literally destroyed the floor with his landing, and she's standing there like, what just happened to my life? On the other hand, Julius looks like a total beast. His appearance alone is enough to make Theo start sweating, completely unsure of what to do next. But here's the thing, his worries are totally unnecessary. Julius just bursts out laughing, giving Theo a not-so-gentle pat on the back, as if he's some sort of proud older brother. He's surprised, really surprised, by the amount of talent Theo's carrying. Then, without missing a beat, he casually mentions that while it was a bit disrespectful to kill his teacher, Rendon definitely deserved it. And then, get this, he invites Theo to join the White Armor Dragon Cavalry. Yup, you heard that right. Julius Ragnar, the Demon Dragon, just asked Theo to join his elite squad. Evelyn? She's not even shocked. She saw this coming a mile away. But the crowd? Oh man, their jaws are literally on the floor. They cannot believe someone as inexperienced as Theo, who hasn't even gone through his awakening ceremony, is getting scouted by the infamous Julius Ragnar. And guess who else is here? Remington. Yeah, he's lurking in the back, asking some random guy if he's ever heard of an apprentice swordsman being recruited like this. The guy? He's clueless. He's like, uh, no, this has never happened. And of course, Remington knows that. He's just fishing for some confirmation. Meanwhile, we get a glimpse into Theo's head. He's thinking, it's impossible to gauge someone's true potential before their mana hall opens. Sure, Julius can see my swordsmanship, but can he see my magical potential? Even someone like him can't be sure. Despite all that, Theo doesn't even hesitate. He flat out declines the offer like, nah, I'm good. No hesitation, no second guessing, just straight up rejection. And let me tell you, the silence in that hall, deafening. Julius Ragnar, this legendary commander, just got turned down and the crowd is left standing there trying to process what just happened. Their jaws, still on the floor. News of this spreads like wildfire. And before you know it, everyone's talking about Theo. Half the people think he's being humble. The other half think he's straight up arrogant. But the story doesn't end there. We get a quick shift to Camellia Palace, where we meet Emil Ragnar, who is not happy. She's pissed that things are spiraling out of control and that Rendon got himself killed. But one of her men reassures her, reminding her that Rendon was a complete noob anyway, assigned to his position because, frankly, he wasn't good enough for anything else. Emil brushes it off, not too concerned about his death because... Let's be honest, he wasn't much of a loss. So we switch scenes and catch up with Emil Ragnar, who's talking to her brother, 
the Sky Dragon, Ed Troyvan. You might remember him from the pub scene earlier. She's not happy. Emil explains that the demon dragon Julius reached out to Theo personally, which in itself is troubling. But what's even worse? Rumors are flying that Evelyn was behind this whole thing. This means they can't interfere anymore by assigning Theo a new master. If Theo starts making waves, their plan to take control of Rose Palace will get a lot more complicated. And that's when Axion enters the scene, super casual, like nothing's wrong. He asks why they're even stressing over this. According to him, there's no chance the clan head will get involved, so their plan can keep moving forward without any issues. But Emil isn't having it. She makes it clear that for their plan to work, taking control of Rose Palace without offending the clan leader, Theo needs to stay powerless. Axion just nods, acting like he's totally in control. He says he's sure Theo is still powerless. I mean, how much could someone like Theo really have changed, right? He figures that Evelyn and Julius just have a soft spot for underdogs, so there's no reason to freak out. But Ed Troyvan? He's not vibing with his nephew's laid-back attitude. He warns Axion to take the situation seriously. That's when Axion pulls out a letter and, with a sly grin, tells them that since they're both so worried, he'll just mess with Theo a little to remind him of his place. What could go wrong, right? Next scene. We're at the training grounds where Evelyn is watching Theo wrap up a training session. She's impressed with how far he's come. Theo thanks her, admitting that it's definitely different learning from a proper master like her. Then, Evelyn drops the question we've all been wondering about. She asks why he didn't join the White Armor Dragon Cavalry. Theo pauses, thinking to himself. And here's where it gets interesting. He admits he's got a tiny bit of regret. After all, in his past life, joining them was his dream. But now, things are different. He knows that joining the cavalry too early would limit his potential. He's aiming higher. He's got his eyes on the top. And the awakening ceremony is the key. So he smiles and tells Evelyn he didn't want any special privileges. And besides, he still feels like he's not quite ready. For now, he's happy just training with her, focusing on the awakening ceremony. Evelyn seems to buy it, but she reminds him that Julius will probably be disappointed after getting turned down like that. Big yikes, right? But Theo just shrugs it off. He's got bigger plans. Then something cool happens. Theo decides to use his new observation skill for the first time. He scans Evelyn's stats, and whoa. She's a high-ranking swordwoman, no question about it. But that's not all. He also learns that Evelyn admires his humility and character. Training him has brought her a sense of purpose she hasn't felt in a long time. And here's the kicker. She misses her time in the White Armored Dragon Cavalry. Theo's surprised by this little revelation, and he files it away for later. But before he can think too much about it, a new guy walks in, introducing himself as Sybil Dree. He's from the Southern Inspection Post and says he's got something important to discuss with Theo. And let's just say, Theo's not feeling good about this. Sybil's got a serious, intimidating vibe that instantly makes Theo sweat. Naturally, Theo uses his observation skill again, and he discovers that Sybil's got a strong desire to spar with him. Yup, this guy isn't here for casual chit-chat. Theo's anxiety kicks into overdrive, and he's terrified at the thought of going up against this guy. Right on cue, the system notification pops up with Theo's next tutorial quest. His goal is to shed the title of Imbecile of Ragnar. He's already made some progress, but he's still got a long way to go. Sybil, on the other hand, is blunt about his intentions. He straight up says he wants to follow Theo. He confesses that he was one of those people who used to ignore Theo, writing him off as Ragnar's imbecile. He admits he thought that title was a perfect fit for Theo. And yeah, Theo appreciates the honesty, but he can't help but feel a bit pissed off. I mean, Sybil's practically bad-mouthing him to his face, without even realizing it. But Sybil's change of heart came when he saw something that blew him away. Theo's insane dedication. Every morning, the young master was out there training harder than anyone else. And the results? Oh man, Sybil was thrilled watching Theo take down that fraud, Rendon, in that epic fight. He still couldn't forget the sight of Rendon's head flying through the air and seeing demon dragon Julius Ragnar personally invite Theo to join the White Armored Dragon Cavalry. From that moment on, Theo became Sybil's idol. Sybil explains that he had pretty much given up on himself, always being called the idiot of the Southern Inspection Office. But Theo's rise inspired him to change. All Sybil wanted now was the chance to clash swords with his hero, the guy who gave him hope. Theo's surprised by the young man's straightforwardness. Normally, He'd be skeptical of someone's intentions, but thanks to his observation skill, he can tell that Sybil is genuine. The guy's respect for Theo is real, 
and all he truly wants is a sparring match. At this point, Theo is starting to realize something big. After taking down Rendon, and now with rumors swirling about Lord Julius's attention, he expected people with massive inferiority complexes to swarm him, looking to test his strength. But instead, people are starting to admire and even follow him. That means some still have Ragnar pride in their veins, and Theo could use that. After all, if he wants to become head of the Ragnar clan, he's going to need loyal subordinates. Plus, this could help him progress on his final tutorial quest, getting rid of that humiliating title, Ragnar's imbecile, for good. Something he was never able to shake off in his past life. Determined to take full advantage of this opportunity, Theo turns to Evelyn and asks for permission to spar with Sybil. His master? She's all for it. Evelyn encourages him to show off what he's learned. With that, Theo formally introduces himself as Theo Ragnar, apprentice swordsman of the Rose Palace, awaiting the awakening ceremony under the guidance of Master Evelyn. Evelyn, the one-armed sword master, smiles with approval. Sybil's clumsy but earnest as he salutes back, introducing himself as an apprentice swordsman of the Southern Inspection Post, specializing in Karai clan swordsmanship, all about speed and precision. And with that, the sparring match kicks off. Sybil blasts off the ground like a madman, going for the kill right from the start. But Theo's ready. He blocks the first attack, and their blades clash, sparks flying. The dude might be known as the idiot of the Southern Inspection Post, but man, his speed is no joke. Sybil's confidence in his quick strikes is obvious. From the first exchange alone, he can already tell Theo's skill is the real deal. Meanwhile, Theo's wondering why this guy even has the nickname Idiot in the first place. If this were his previous life, Theo knows he would have struggled to keep up with someone this fast. But this isn't the same Theo anymore. He's come a long way. With a swift, powerful move, Theo goes on the offensive, and with one solid strike, he sends Sybil flying like a ragdoll. The force is so strong, poor Sybil loses his grip on his sword, and he crashes into the stands of the training area. Sybil? Barely standing. He's almost throwing up from the sheer impact to his solar plexus, but he manages to get up, clearly overwhelmed. Despite the brutal loss, Sybil praises Theo's mastery of the sword and concedes defeat with gratitude. Theo, ever the graceful victor, salutes Sybil, telling him it was a good fight. As he holds his sword up in salute, he catches a glimpse of his reflection in the blade and gets an idea. Could he use his observation skill on himself? Turns out he can. Activating the skill, Theo sees all his talents and stats laid out in front of him. It's a game changer. He's officially a level 1 swordsman with balanced stats and a whopping 190 points in magic power, way higher than he expected. He realizes that with his talents now fully visible, he can keep unlocking more as he progresses through quests. He's got four more locked slots to fill. So, after using his observation skill on himself, Theo's pumped about his ability to check his stats whenever he wants. And let me tell you, he's got some serious magic power, thanks to his past life's magic and that dragon heart beating in his chest. But there's one stat that's got him seriously annoyed, his luck. It's sitting at a brutal negative 49 points. Theo wonders if he's cursed or something. Maybe all the misfortunes from his previous life were because of this ridiculously low luck stat. Either way, he knows one thing for sure. He's got to fix this fast. But Theo's so focused on the sparring session with Sybil and checking his stats that he doesn't even notice the crowd of young swordsmen gathering around the arena. They've practically formed a circle, watching him closely, and their intentions? Completely unknown. Theo figures that after beheading Rendon and gaining the respect of Commander Julius Ragnar, this kind of attention was only natural. With Ragnar's rule of the strong, people either become envious of you or they admire you. Evelyn, though, can see things clearly. These guys? They're part of the latter group. They're not here to challenge Theo. They're here to admire him. You can see it in their eyes. They've heard the rumors, and now they're seeing the truth. Theo is the real deal. They're impressed. In fact, some of them are imagining themselves in Sybil's shoes, wondering if they'd even last a second against Theo. The thought alone is making them itch to test their skills against the young master. Among them is one young swordsman, Eody Nalen. Theo scans the crowd and spots him, which immediately surprises the guy. Without hesitation, Theo calls Eody forward for a spar. Eody, a little stunned, steps up and salutes, introducing himself as the third son of Viscount Nalen, specializing in double ascension swordsmanship. Theo returns the salute, ready for a good fight. And with that, they dive straight into battle. 
Each clash of their blades sharpens Theo's swordsmanship even more. Yodi isn't a pushover, though. He's fast, clever, and even manages to land a slash that seems impossible to counter. But in that moment, something clicks for Theo, time slows down, and he adjusts his grip, blocking the attack with perfect precision. Eodi's blade goes flying from his hand. It's a decisive victory for Theo. Eodi acknowledges his defeat, but more importantly, he gives Theo his eternal respect. And here's where things get interesting. Gaining Eodi's approval actually increases Theo's luck stat. Theo is stunned. Could his luck really be tied to his reputation? If that's the case, he's just found a way to fix his terrible luck. All he needs to do is keep winning, literally fight his way to better luck. Next up, Banat Ramiro. And let's be real, easy dub. With another win, his luck goes up by another point. Then comes Eric Moran. He puts up a decent fight, but it's still not enough to stop Theo's momentum. After that, we've got Manfred Nonbert, and then Manuel Noir, who doesn't stand a chance. Even the thuggish-looking Void Perink? Theo wipes the floor with him in under a minute. At this point, Theo's on fire. He's totally immersed in the sparring frenzy, and his winning streak is nothing short of impressive. He's beating these young swordsmen one by one. Daniel Reman is just another name added to the list. And even though he's starting to feel the exhaustion creep in, he's still itching for more. Theo calls for the next challenger, but no one steps up. It's clear he's dominated the arena, but when Theo checks his quest progress to shed the title of Ragnar's imbecile, he's only made a 1% improvement. 1%. He's frustrated, realizing that the people in this crowd already respect him. He'll need to seek out stronger foes or show off his skills to those who still doubt him if he wants to make any real progress. Just when he's considering his next move, a man steps forward from the crowd. He tells Theo he looks exhausted and should probably rest. Theo brushes it off, arguing that he'll rest when he needs to, but right now he's still got some fight left in him. And just as Theo says that, Remington Narcio, yeah, one of the four hounds of the North, steps up and formally requests a sparring match. Everyone, including Theo, is completely caught off guard. I mean, this is Remington, the guy who's up there with the strongest swordsman in the entire Ragnar clan, alongside names like Axian Ragnar and Hulkus Lank. Remington says he came early to observe Theo's swordsmanship before the awakening ceremony, and with a calm smile, he salutes Theo, thanking him for honoring his request. He's a genius swordsman, known for his keen senses and unmatched work ethic, but right now, he's just excited. He wasn't expecting to find such a worthy rival in the form of Theo. Theo, standing tall, salutes back with pride. This time, he introduces himself as the 31st son of the great guardian of the North, Kyle Ragnar. Theo's in awe. He never expected to spar with a legend like Remington, someone he respected even in his past life. He means it when he says it's an honor to cross blades with such a renowned figure. The arena is buzzing, and Theo is fired up. He's ready to show Remington just how far he's come. Both fighters lock eyes, and the tension is palpable. The Silver Lion, as Remington is called, unleashes his aura. It's terrifying. Theo wonders for a second if he can actually defeat someone this strong, but there's no turning back now. And then it begins. They charge forward, their blades colliding with such force that sparks fly across the arena. Each clash is so powerful that it literally shakes the stage. Theo's eyes are laser-focused while shards of steel rain down around them. Remington? He's smiling, loving every moment of this intense duel. But then, something happens. After a relentless series of strikes, one of their swords gives out. The blade shatters, and the arena goes deathly silent. The only sound is the clanging of the broken blade hitting the ground. It's Theo's sword. In a single, powerful clash, Remington had sliced Theo's blade clean in half. His sword stops just inches from Theo's neck. The result is clear, Theo has lost. The crowd is stunned. Theo had been dominant all day, but no matter how much he's improved, going up against one of the four hounds is a whole different level. Sybil. Remember him? Can't believe it. He refuses to accept that his idol, Theo, would lose so quickly. But even he has to face reality. Remington is on a whole other plane. And just when everyone is about to write off the duel, Remington does something unexpected. He declares that the duel is actually his loss. The crowd? Shocked. Remington salutes Theo with impeccable form, thanking him for the spar and explaining that Theo's sword was already worn out from all his earlier fights. Plus, Theo was fighting while exhausted. Remington says that in a more ideal setting, with both of them at full strength, the outcome could have been very different. But Theo, 
Ever the pragmatist, insists that on the battlefield, no one offers such considerations. As soon as he lost his blade, he accepted the defeat. Remington just nods, smiling in understanding. And in that moment, something profound happens. Mutual respect is forged between them. The white lion and the former imbecile shake hands, and the crowd watches in awe. One of the four hounds of the North had just publicly acknowledged Theo. This wasn't just a sparring match. This was a game changer for Theo. Not only did his quest progress shoot up to 35%, but his luck stat jumped by 10 points and his reputation skyrocketed. The young swordsmen in the arena, who had doubted him, they're starting to realize that Theo is built different. From the sidelines, Evelyn lets out a sigh of relief. Things couldn't have gone more perfectly. Theo now understands just how strong the four hounds are, thanks to this duel. Despite all his progress, he's still got a lot to work on. The moment he crossed blades with Remington, he felt true power. A reminder that even though he's grown stronger, there's still a long road ahead. It's a shame the duel ended early due to his worn-out condition, but Theo gained so much from that brief exchange. Now, with a clearer picture of what he's up against, Theo knows he needs to actively seek out more ways to grow, both in strength and reputation. His quest to shake off the title of Ragnar's imbecile is still far from over, and he's going to need to find new challenges, stronger foes, to push himself further. After the intense duel, Remington confesses that he didn't just show up for a simple sparring match. He had another purpose. He hands Theo a letter, an invitation to the prestigious Scaled Dragon Society. Now, just hearing that name sends shockwaves through the crowd of young swordsmen watching. The Scaled Dragon Society isn't just any group, it's a high society club with a brutal selection process. For a rising star like Theo, getting invited is a huge deal. Theo, always modest, asks if he's really qualified for something like this. But Remington quickly assures him that Theo is more than deserving of the invite. He downplays the whole thing, saying the society is really just a place for their peers to gather and socialize while waiting for the upcoming awakening ceremony. Nothing too serious, at least, that's what Remington says. But Theo isn't sure if Remington has ulterior motives. You see, Theo knows the Scale Dragon Society is centered around none other than his half-brother, Axion. It's basically a nest of snakes who look at Theo with contempt and ridicule. But Theo realizes this is the perfect opportunity. Not only could it help him progress in his quest, but it's also the ideal chance to do some recon on Axion and Camellia Palace. Knowing there's more to gain than to lose, Theo takes the letter of invitation and thanks Remington, promising to participate and step into the den of his enemies. Remington, thrilled to have reeled in another rising star, shakes Theo's hand, happy to offer any help he can. He tells Theo the meeting will be in two weeks, so he's got just enough time to prepare and come up with a plan. As Remington leaves, Evelyn, cool as ever, takes a drag from her cigarette, looking a bit worried about her new disciple stepping into this dangerous game. Meanwhile, word travels fast, and soon, news of Theo's invite to this high society gathering reaches Rose Palace. Theo's mom, Cecilia, practically bursts into his room, beaming with excitement. She was about to deliver the news herself, but well, Theo already knows. Cecilia's overjoyed. This is the first time Theo's been invited to something so significant, and she's not about to let her son show up unprepared. Without missing a beat, Cecilia's already gathered the palace's grooming team. She knows that everything from Theo's appearance to his composure will be under close scrutiny. The Scaled Dragon Society features Axion, the son of the cunning Emile, and other brilliant talents like Remington, so every detail matters. Cecilia immediately grabs a tape measure and starts taking Theo's sizes, all while giving him advice on attire and demeanor. She's confident that Theo can handle himself when it comes to etiquette, but the finer aspects of high society? That's where she can help. After all, she used to be a successful actress. So if anyone knows how to navigate this world of appearances, it's her. Theo knows that, deep down, his mother has always carried the burden of having an illegitimate child with a commoner concubine status. It wasn't her fault, but in the cutthroat Ragnar clan, where strength is everything, Theo can only imagine how hard it's been for her. She raised him while living under the shadow of his weak reputation in his past life. But this time, things are different. Cecilia might be all smiles and excitement on the outside. But Theo knows she's just a worried mother, concerned for her son's well-being. She wraps him in a tight embrace, assuring Theo that no matter what, she believes in him, that he can achieve anything. And for the first time, Theo lets the warmth of his mother's embrace melt the coldness in his heart. He hugs her back, 
promising himself that this time around, he'll work hard to stop making her worry. But while Cecilia's thoughts are on Theo joining the Scale Dragon Society and making a good impression, Theo's mind is already on something else. All he can think about is destroying this nest of snakes. He knows that the society is filled with enemies, and if he's going to survive, no thrive, he's going to have to pulverize every last one of them. It's been two weeks since Theo's invite to the Scale Dragon Society, and tonight's the night of the banquet. Remington, ever the gentleman, rolls up to Rose Palace in a lavish carriage to pick up Theo. But the moment he sees him, Remington has to do a double take. Theo? This isn't the same guy who spent days in training clothes. Thanks to his mother and the palace staff, Theo's rocking some seriously exquisite drip. He looks less like a warrior and more like an aristocrat, and Remington's genuinely impressed. Theo tries to brush it off as a joke, but Remington isn't kidding. He's blown away by the transformation. And to be fair, Theo has changed a lot in just two weeks. He's taller, his muscles are more defined, and it's all thanks to his relentless training. Interestingly enough, Remington had joined him every day for those two weeks, and they've gotten pretty close. Theo also built quite the following during this time. Sybil and the other young swordsmen now practically idolize him. Poor Evelyn has been stuck training what's become a whole battalion of Theo fanatics. Let's just say it's been a lively two weeks. But now, Theo's heading into his first formal banquet, and while he's still recovering from dealing with all his overeager followers, he's ready. Remington assures him there's no need to be nervous, but he leaves him with a single warning. His friend, Axion, can be very mischievous. In fact, it was Axion who extended the invitation to Theo, wanting to meet the new rising star. And here's the kicker. The entire banquet was organized for Theo's sake. That changes everything, doesn't it? But not in a bad way. Theo's actually looking forward to it. He's mentally preparing to be insulted left and right. But that's fine. This is exactly the kind of situation he can use to turn the tables. Meanwhile, up at Camellia Palace, Axion Ragnar, also known as the Dark Tiger, is already sipping on expensive booze, just itching to turn the imbecile of Ragnar into his next plaything. The banquet is just one big opportunity for him to mess with Theo. The carriage pulls up in front of the lavish palace, the banquet venue. Theo steps out, immediately scanning the area. This is Camellia Palace, the home turf of the same people who destroyed his life and his past. Axion and his crew. They're the ones who ruined him, his mother, and everything tied to Rose Palace. His mind flashes to thoughts of vengeance, but Remington interrupts, reminding him that Axion will personally greet them at the entrance. Theo knows exactly why Axion invited him. The guy probably thinks it's up to him to stop Theo's growing momentum. But Theo didn't come into this snake's nest without a plan of his own. He's ready to show Axion just who he's dealing with. As they approach the palace, something catches Theo's eye. Up on one of the higher floors of the palace, he spots a strange blue light, the kind that only appears for a system quest. He's momentarily distracted by the possible quest inside, and that's when it happens. Out of nowhere, something comes plummeting from above, aimed right at Theo. Remington tries to act fast, but before he can even get close, it explodes, a cloud of white smog billowing out. Remington, panicked, calls out for Theo, but thankfully, it's not as bad as it looked. Theo's fine. Turns out it was just a sack of flour launched from above, a childish prank. Remington is furious at the prank, while Theo, he's annoyed. He admits that he wouldn't have been able to dodge it, and worse, the outfit his mom painstakingly prepared would have been completely ruined. After the childish flower prank, Theo had a moment of reflection. If this had been his past life, he might have suspected Remington was in on the joke. But this time around, it's clear Remington's just as angry and confused as he is. The white lion was ready to throw hands over it, furious at the unexpected welcome. As for Theo, he figured this was probably the best those noble idiots watching from the palace windows could come up with. Then, a familiar voice cuts through the crowd. It's none other than Axion Ragnar, finally showing his smug face. He brushes off the incident as a little greeting between brothers, claiming it's just a simple courtesy. But Remington wasn't buying it. He was genuinely pissed. Axion, though? He was loving every second of it. Theo immediately uses his observation skill on his half-brother, and what he sees is as twisted as he expected. Axion's talents include madness, psychopathy, and an overwhelming potential for swordsmanship. In Axion's mind, Theo was just a new toy to play with, and he couldn't wait to see how it would unfold. But instead of snapping back, Theo just smiles and thanks him. Yup, thanks him for the warm welcome. 
This confuses his psychopathic brother, but Theo keeps up the act, saying that with how welcoming Axion's been, he's really grateful and looking forward to the party. Axion's confusion quickly turns to elation. To him, it seems like Theo's finally becoming interesting, and he's loving it. Finally, they enter the banquet hall, where the Scaled Dragon Society is gathered. It's an exclusive event. Only the most promising nobles are invited to wine, dine, and talk shop. But tonight, everyone's focused on the special invitee, Theo Ragnar. And let's just say, the reaction is far from welcoming. Most of the nobles can't wrap their heads around why Axion would invite someone like Theo, the so-called imbecile of Ragnar. Sure, he's got Ragnar blood, but his reputation as a failure hangs over him like a cloud. Even though he's decked out in some seriously cold drip, credit to his mom and the palace staff, they still see him as trash. The nobles, smug as ever, don't even bother lowering their voices. They openly talk about how Axion must be playing with his new toy, snickering at Theo's expense. Remington, feeling embarrassed by the crowd's rudeness, apologizes to Theo, explaining that these events usually aren't this scandalous. But Theo? He's completely unfazed. He lets them talk trash. In fact, the more they badmouth him, the sweeter it'll be when he crushes them later. While all this is going on, Theo notices the blue quest light he saw earlier. It's nearby. He's pretty sure it's significant, but right now, he can't approach it without raising suspicion. At that moment, Axion, the host of this twisted party, descends the stairs with a smirk, asking his brother if he's enjoying the event. Theo forces himself to stay calm, sticking to the plan. He smiles and thanks Axion again for the invitation, playing along. Axion, grinning like the manipulative snake he is, sarcastically apologizes for the flower incident, admitting that maybe he went a little too far. Then, in a flash, he's right in front of Theo, closing the distance in the blink of an eye. He grabs Theo's shoulders tightly, putting on a show for everyone as he demands that Theo accept his apology in front of the entire hall. Remington wants to intervene, but before he can, Theo steps in. He calmly insists that Axion has nothing to apologize for. Using Axion's own words, Theo calls it a simple greeting between brothers. The psycho's at a loss for words. Theo's composure is unshakable. He's too calm, too collected for Axion's mind games to work. After a brief pause, Axion laughs, patting Theo on the back like a proud older brother. He's honestly impressed. Theo's changed so much since they were kids and now. He's becoming fun. The nobles watching this exchange? They're eating it up. They mockingly call Theo Axion's lapdog, whispering about his illegitimate lineage. In their eyes, even though Theo and Axion share Ragnar blood, they're on completely different levels. Theo's mother, Cecilia, was a commoner concubine, while Axion hails from the powerful Troyvan clan, a swordsmanship powerhouse from the east. To these nobles, Theo is little more than a nobody, a far cry from Axion's noble, prestigious bloodline. Theo's been taking it all in. The insults, the sneers, the outright disrespect, and instead of getting flustered, he's been letting it fuel the fire inside. But there's one thing that's confusing these snickering nobles. Remington's closeness with the so-called imbecile of Ragnar. As they start throwing insults Remington's way, even going so far as to question his lineage as an illegitimate son of the Narcio family, the white lion is ready to snap. Theo can tell that Remington is about two seconds away from stealing the spotlight, but that won't do. Before Axion can lead Theo upstairs, Theo takes control. He calmly asserts that, since he's just arrived, he should greet his new friends. And with that, he walks straight over to the table where the nobles had been running their mouths. Every pair of eyes in the room is now fixed on him, on the imbecile of Ragnar. Theo quietly grabs a bottle of wine from the table, walking over to the noble who'd been smearing Remington's name. He makes a motion to pour the guy a drink, and the noble, smug as ever, smiles and asks if he said something wrong. That's when Theo shifts his grip on the bottle and smashes it over the guy's head without mercy. Boom. The entire hall goes dead silent. Even Remington, and yes, even Axion, who's usually unfazed by chaos, are stunned by the sudden brutal move. The noble, now bleeding from his head, grabs at his hair in agony as blood stains his blonde locks. Theo stands over him, still holding the broken, bloody bottle, while the noble spits out curses, furious at being humiliated in front of everyone. Before Blondie can finish his rant, Theo sends a brutal kick that breaks the noble's jaw cutting off his yapping with a sickening crack. Theo's plan has officially begun. His eyes turn cold, almost crazy, 
as he calmly explains that he was just giving Blondie a little greeting, only to get such a hurtful response in return. The other nobles? Frozen in place, too scared and too confused to process what's happening. Meanwhile, Theo's quest progress quietly ticks up to 43%. Remington, watching this unfold, can't help but wonder if Theo's doing this for his sake. After all, he spent the last two weeks training with Theo and knows he's not the type to be a hot-headed thug. But now, as Blondie bleeds on the palace floor, Theo insists this is just his form of welcome. Theo steps on the noble's arm, pinning him to the floor as he begins to apply pressure, the tension building in the room. He leans in, his voice deadly calm, and says, Since I've sent my hellos, I guess it's time for goodbyes now. Blondie, now desperate, starts shouting for Theo to stop, but it's too late. Theo stomps down hard, and the sound of bones shattering echoes through the banquet hall. The other nobles, who were talking trash just minutes ago, are now utterly tongue-tied, stunned in a silence by the sheer ruthlessness of Theo's actions. Blondie, jaw broken and arm shattered, passes out from the pain, his drool mixing with blood on the palace carpet. Theo discards his limp body like the trash it is and turns to the rest of the crowd, casually asking if anyone else wants to say hello. The tension in the room is palpable, and Theo's quest progress jumps again, this time to 66%. Suddenly, knights who had been hiding in the shadows burst into the hall, surrounding Theo on all sides. Their blades drawn, they're ready to neutralize the threat, for swords hover around Theo, trapping him in place. These knights want payback for the insult to their young master and declare that the punishment for such vile actions must be death. But Theo? He smiles, this is exactly what he wanted. His plan is working perfectly. He casually asks the knights who their young master is, and they proudly respond, Ian Han Abbey, the third young master of the Han Abbey clan. Theo chuckles to himself. The Han Abbey clan, one of the six snow clans that support Ragnar. It's all falling into place. Theo knew that the bodyguards of these spoiled nobles wouldn't just stand by and watch. They were always the type to look down on the imbecile of Ragnar, waiting for any excuse to put him in his place. But Theo has them right where he wants them. With a voice full of pride, he asks the knights, So, what's the problem if I roughed up your young master? The knights, full of self-righteous fury, demand his death. But Theo, undeterred, leans in, eyes gleaming with intensity. He coldly asks if the dogs of one of Ragnar's bannerman clans dare to threaten the life of a direct bloodline of Ragnar. And then he drops the bomb. Kyle Ragnar, his father, isn't exactly known for tolerating disrespect to his family. The knights falter, realizing the gravity of their situation. It's one thing to defend their master, but threatening Kyle Ragnar's bloodline? That's a death sentence for them. The knights, who were so confident just a moment ago, felt the weight of Theo's threat sink in. Their grip on their swords loosened, and the rage they felt for their young master's humiliation was quickly replaced by fear. The kind of fear that only the Ragnar clan could command. Theo wasn't the same imbecile they had mocked for years. The oppressive aura he now exuded was suffocating, a stark reminder that Theo, as a direct bloodline of Ragnar, was untouchable. These knights weren't dealing with just anyone. They were dealing with the blood of the dragon, and declaring death upon him could mean the destruction of their entire snow clan. And Ragnar wasn't just any lord. He was the ruler of the north, the one who reigned over the six snow clans. To threaten his bloodline was a death sentence. For so long, people had forgotten that Theo, too, carried this protection and prestige, mainly because he had been seen as a useless descendant. But now, that was over. The knights realized their colossal blunder. They needed to apologize and fast, but it was already too late. Theo had issued a silent kill order to a mysterious presence lurking nearby. And just like that, the swift glint of a blade blinded the room for a split second. The next thing they knew, for severed heads flew through the air and the knight's blood splattered across the palace floor. The entire hall was frozen in shock. And Theo? He stood there, calm as the eye of a storm, while the blood of his enemies swirled around him. The mysterious figure responsible for the slaughter gracefully landed on the blood-soaked carpet. It was none other than his master, Evelyn. The arrogant nobles, who had been so carefree earlier, now felt a looming threat overhead. They had no idea that things would escalate to this point. Theo's quest progress jumped to 70%, and even Axion, the one who orchestrated this twisted banquet, had no choice but to watch as his carefully laid plans crumbled. This was no longer a game. 
The banquet had become a showcase of Theo's dominance. Evelyn turned her disciple and asked, almost casually, when he realized she had been tailing him. Theo, not entirely sure himself, admitted that it was a given. He didn't know why she'd followed him all the way to Camellia Palace, but one thing was clear. Thanks to her intervention, Theo now had the upper hand, and the nobles were terrified. The hall was gripped by a tense silence, the kind where everyone is waiting for Theo's next move. All eyes were on him. Moments ago, these nobles had ridiculed him, but now they were scared to even speak. But let's rewind for a second, because this wasn't a random act. The night before the banquet, Commander Julius had paid Evelyn a secret visit. He'd come to nag her about not taking on more disciples while still diligently training Theo every day. The truth is, Julius had been sneaking into Evelyn's quarters for ages, mostly to steal her expensive wine and torment her with his presence. And as usual, Evelyn didn't entertain his games. But this time, Julius had a different reason for showing up. He wanted to know what Evelyn saw in Theo. Why was she training him so seriously? What was it about this kid? After all, even Axion had trained under Evelyn. So saying that Theo was beyond expectations was a bold claim. Julius was curious. Evelyn didn't hold back. She told Julius that Theo was different. His attitude, his work ethic, and his talent were unlike any she had ever seen. In fact, she said Theo had more potential than Axion himself. That's no small statement. Julius, who trusted Evelyn's judgment when it came to talent, after all, she had two eyes while he only had one, admitted that something about Theo didn't add up. How could someone change so drastically overnight? The most logical explanation, he thought, was that Theo had been hiding his strength all along. But why? Why keep his power hidden for so long, only to unleash it now? Evelyn had her own theory. She believed that people who move too fast, who rush their steps, are destined to trip and fall. But with Theo, it was different. It felt like he was being chased by something intangible, like he was pushing himself out of fear. That's why she was worried about him attending the Scaled Dragon Society banquet. Julius, finishing off another bottle of wine, agreed that Axion was indeed someone to worry about. But that's not why he'd suggested Evelyn follow Theo tonight. Julius had a gut feeling that something big was going to happen at the banquet. And here's why. Being a Ragnar himself, Julius knew firsthand that when wolf cubs hungry for blood gather in one place, they'll do anything to establish a hierarchy. Commander Julius had paid a visit to Evelyn, trying once again to convince her to rejoin the White Armored Dragon Cavalry. He wasn't just interested in Theo, he wanted Evelyn back in the ranks too. Julius refused to accept that Evelyn had retired just because she couldn't ride a dragon anymore. Before he left, he laid out a pristine uniform on her table, hoping it would tempt her to come back. And honestly, maybe it worked. Sure, Evelyn lost an expensive bottle of wine that night. But in return, it seems like she's found her purpose again. Back to the present. Inside the blood-soaked banquet hall, Evelyn begins to piece together what's really going on. She realizes that Theo probably noticed her following him from the start and had orchestrated this entire situation on purpose. Maybe he joined the Scale Dragon Society with this very scenario in mind. Her worries? Unnecessary. She starts wondering, at what point did Theo realize she was tailing him? Turns out, Theo sensed Evelyn's presence the moment he got into the carriage. Thanks to his dragon heart, he can extend his energy perception like a sixth sense. But right now, that doesn't matter. What matters is that Theo's plan for revenge is in full motion. Turning to Evelyn, Theo asks the room a chilling question. What is the punishment for nobles who show blatant disrespect to a successor candidate of the Ragnar clan? The guilty nobles almost faint on the spot. They know what's coming. And Evelyn, ever the rule follower, calmly states that according to clan law, the punishment can be as extreme as immediate execution. Theo grins. He set the stage perfectly. But instead of calling for their heads, he says he's feeling merciful. These nobles are just children after all. Theo announces that he'll settle for taking one arm from each noble involved. The guilty party start panicking, but it's too late. Evelyn moves like lightning, an unstoppable force. She slices through the room like a deadly machine, aiming at the bratty nobles who dared to insult Theo. The second son of the Byron clan tries to dodge. His right arm is severed cleanly. The first son of the red and white mercenary corps screams as blood pours from his stump. The dainty fourth daughter of the series merchant guild loses her arm in one swift motion. The third son of the Clark clan attempts to flee, only to be caught and cut down in seconds. Even the first daughter of the Howard clan becomes another victim, reduced to a one-armed mess on the banquet floor. 
Theo's quest progress surges to 79%. One noble, two terrified to think straight, crawls toward Axion, begging for help. But Axion? He simply repeats Theo's words, telling the crawling noble that this is just another greeting between brothers. And as the noble whimpers at Axion's feet, a glint of steel flashes in his peripheral vision before his arm is sliced clean off, his blood nearly splattering Axion's clothes. The first son of the Parenk family twists in agony, while Axion, surprisingly, just watches. He and Evelyn exchange glances, a silent acknowledgement passing between former student and master. Even Axion hadn't expected to see his old trainer in action here, but he nods as Evelyn salutes with her bloodstained blade. Axion finally realizes this banquet isn't about him anymore. It's become Theo's show of dominance. Evelyn had only targeted those who insulted the Ragnar bloodline, meaning even as a fellow successor, Axion has no authority to stop what's happening. Theo's revenge is unfolding perfectly. In just a matter of minutes, Evelyn had severed the right arms of 14 nobles. Their status as swordsmen? Ruined. Sure, they can take their arms to a priest and get them reattached, but their reputation is shattered. And with it, Theo's quest progress hits 79%. Everything is going according to plan. Meanwhile, Axion's thoughts shift. He's more curious than angry, wondering how in the world Theo, the imbecile of the Rose Palace, managed to get both Remington and Evelyn on his side. This brother of his? He's evolved into something terrifying. But that's the psycho and Axion talking. Deep down, he's thrilled. He wants to crush this new version of Theo under his boot more than ever. As Theo finishes what he came to do, he calls for Evelyn and Remington to leave with him. Together, they make their way out of the palace, leaving the frightened stares of the remaining nobles fixed on Theo. But before they exit, Theo and Axion lock eyes. Brother to brother, successor to successor. No words are spoken, but the tension between them is electric. Theo pauses for just a second, grabs Axion's arm, and tightens his grip, enough to wrinkle Axion's suit. After a beat, Theo lets go and waves goodbye with a sly grin, telling Axion he had a ton of fun at this bloody banquet. As they walk away, the final system notification pops up. Theo's tutorial quest to escape the title of Imbecile of Ragnar is finally complete. Axion, he's absolutely fuming. After watching his perfect plan blow up in his face, he storms out of his own palace, screaming Theo's name at the top of his lungs. As much as he wants to make a move right then and there, Axion knows it wouldn't be wise. Not yet. Meanwhile, Theo? He's riding high. With all the tutorial quests completed, no one in their right mind would dare call him the imbecile of the family anymore. His public perception has completely shifted. And his reward for pulling off this transformation? An experience elixir. A tonic that instantly raises your level by 5 if you're below level 30. This is just the beginning. The tutorial might be over, but Theo's true revenge is only getting started. News of the bloodshed spreads fast. Everyone across the palaces is shocked to hear what went down. Axion's prestigious scale dragon society? Torn limb from limb, both literally and figuratively. But Theo? He's in a celebratory mood. His subordinates take him to a pub to celebrate his flashy and gory high society debut. Everyone is there. Even Evelyn shows up for a drink. Theo can't help but wonder how the scaled dragon society feels now after being humiliated by the man they used to call an imbecile. Meanwhile, back at Camellia Palace, things are tense. Emil Ragnar, Axion's mother, is in disbelief. She's heard about what happened, and she's shocked. Not only did they give Theo justification for his actions, but he also chopped off everyone's arms right in front of Axion. Emil is furious, and she lets her son know it. She had warned Axion not to take Theo lightly. But now, they've handed him complete authority to go wild. Axion, trying to defend himself, insists that once Theo gains more recognition, it'll be harder to take over the Rose Palace. He assures his mother not to worry, but Emil isn't having it. She points out his mistakes, frustrated that their great plan has almost fallen apart because of his arrogance. Axion, realizing he's not getting through, backs down and leaves the room. As Axion walks away, Emil reflects on how her son could be so obnoxious. Her brother, Ed Troyven, chimes in, joking that Axion is just like she was when she was younger. But Emil isn't in the mood for jokes. Ed quickly apologizes, then tries to calm her down. He reassures her that this incident, while chaotic, might not be worth worrying about as much as she thinks. Ed explains that while the Rose Palace has been outside of the clan leader's interest for a while, 
it's still a part of the clan head's harem, meaning it's hard to take ownership of it. Even though it's known as a place where riffraff gather, it still holds the support of the clan leader himself. He reveals his plan. Thanks to Theo's recent chaos at the banquet, they now have enough justification to suppress him through legal procedures. Emil, hearing this, starts to calm down. She realizes that the reason she feared Theo becoming stronger was because she thought his power and influence would expand over time. But now, thanks to Ed's strategy, they can use Theo's own actions against him to keep him in check. She starts to see the bigger picture. The Camellia Palace can legally suppress Theo, and the Rose Palace will have no choice but to bow to them. Ed assures her that everything is already in motion, and that by tomorrow morning, she'll hear some great news. He suggests she take the night to relax. Even mentioning that he's prepared an aromatic candle from the southern volcanic region for her bath. Emil finally decides to trust in her brother's plan and expresses her gratitude before retreating to her quarters. Meanwhile, back at the tavern, Remington, who's never been one to handle his alcohol, seems drunk, even though he's only been drinking orange juice. He tells Theo how shocked he was by what went down at the banquet. Remington hadn't realized how much Theo cared for him until that night. Theo, a bit confused, asks what he means, finding it funny to watch Remington get all sentimental over some juice. But Remington is serious. He recalls how, despite enduring countless insults himself, Theo didn't hesitate for even a second when the nobles started hurling insults at Remington. Theo stepped up, no questions asked. Remington feels embarrassed that he didn't do more to stand up for himself, especially after everything Theo did for him. He looks at Theo in a new light, realizing just how much his friend had endured in the past. Theo, the untalented, useless child who everyone had looked down on for years, had somehow found the willpower to keep going, to become stronger against all odds. In Remington's eyes, Theo isn't just battling the Camellia Palace. He's battling everything and everyone that ever tried to push him down. So, after everything that went down at the banquet, Remington is getting teary-eyed, overcome with emotion. He genuinely believes that Theo's bold actions, wielding his sword without hesitation and standing up against the nobles, were all for him. Theo, a bit bewildered by this, quickly realizes that Remington has completely misunderstood the situation. Before Theo can clear things up, Remington stands up, inspired. Despite the orders of his clan, he shares that he wants to follow a different path, and that path is to follow Theo. The whole tavern erupts in cheers, with people praising Theo and his friend as if they were some legendary duo. Theo, now a little embarrassed, tries to correct the misunderstanding, but just then, he hears Evelyn's voice in his head, telepathically telling him to just let it be. She's watching from across the room and calmly advises him that this isn't such a bad misunderstanding. After all, it seems like everyone intends to follow Theo now. With that, Theo can't help but smile, but deep down he still feels like he's nothing special. All of his newfound strength? It's thanks to the status window, the mysterious system that's been guiding him. As Theo reflects, he looks at his stats and realizes that every bit of progress he's made comes from this strange system. He recalls thinking, at first, that the status window might be a manifestation of his own regrets from his past life. But the more he studies it, the more he understands it's something beyond him, something bigger. It even gives him a sense of deja vu, but he brushes it off. Whatever it is, it's helping him improve, and that's what matters. After the Scaled Dragon Society incident, Theo noticed his level had increased, and with each level up, the system gives him points to distribute across his stats. Now, Theo's starting to understand that he has complete control over how he can improve his abilities. The future ahead of him, shining with potential, is both exciting and terrifying. Evelyn catches a glimpse of Theo's sinister smile as he thinks about all of this, and it leaves her feeling a bit concerned. But Theo's got bigger things on his mind, specifically the counterattack from Camellia Palace. He knows they won't sit quietly after what he pulled, so he decides to start preparing. Theo turns to Remington, casually calling him Remy, and asks if he's willing to help with something important. Remington, a bit taken aback by the sudden friendly nickname, assures him that he's ready to help with anything. Theo then pulls out a piece of paper and hands it to Remy, explaining that the war for the throne between him and Axion is about to begin, and he'll need all the help he can get. Remington becomes silent, his mind drifting back to his past life, where he eventually became the clan head of Narcio, and the Narcio forces became powerful enough to challenge the Ragnar clan. Theo recognizes just how valuable it is to have someone like Remington on his side, and in this moment, he's determined to solidify their bond. Remington, now fully committed, 
reassures Theo that he's pledged his loyalty and will do everything in his power to support him. Theo thanks him sincerely, knowing that with Remy by his side, his chances of success have just skyrocketed. But just as they're starting to plan, the tavern door suddenly bursts open. A group of knights storm in, shouting Theo's name. Everyone turns, startled, as the knights announce that Theo is under arrest for assault, threats, and intimidation. Evelyn immediately calls, but Theo remains calm, telling her to relax. He steps forward to see the arrest warrant, noticing the ink is still fresh, meaning his enemies were in a mad rush to get this out. Despite knowing the charges are a setup, Theo decides to go without a fight. Recognizing this is just another move in the game. He's quickly handcuffed, and as he's being taken away, Theo turns to his friends with a confident smile. He trusts them to handle everything while he's gone. Remington and Evelyn are both in complete shock. Remington, in particular, can't believe what's happening. But then his focus shifts back to the piece of paper Theo handed him just moments before the knights barged in. And now, as Theo is dragged away to face whatever traps his enemies have set, the question is, What's on that paper, and how will Remington and Evelyn respond? Back at Rose Palace, the news of Theo's arrest hits like a bomb. Cecilia, Theo's mother, is completely stunned. When she hears that her son is being taken to the tribunal, she literally falls to her knees in shock. Her servant rushes to her side, worried, but Cecilia assures him she's fine, though the news has clearly shaken her. She asks why Theo was taken, and the servant reveals it's because of the Scale Dragon Society incident. Theo's being accused of inciting rebellion. Cecilia, trying to process everything, is surprised. She wasn't expecting Theo's invitation to such a prestigious event to lead to such a mess. Her servant even mentions that Theo might be put on trial, and given the damage he caused at the banquet, it won't be easy for him to escape punishment. But Cecilia, despite her shock, believes in her son. She's convinced that Theo can handle this. That's the kind of person he is, resilient. All she can do now is pray for his safe return. Meanwhile, inside the carriage, Theo is being escorted to the tribunal. As they arrive at their destination, Theo realizes it's been a long time since he's seen this place. He knows the stakes are high. After obliterating the Scale Dragon Society, there's no way he'll get a simple slap on the wrist. He's well aware that, as a successor of Ragnar, this trial will likely question his very right to the throne. As the knights order him to get out of the carriage, Theo walks with confidence. His enemies might think they're about to crush him, but Theo's smiling, because everything is going exactly as he planned. The knights announce Theo's arrival, and as he steps inside the tribunal, he's greeted by some of the most powerful figures in the Ragnar clan. Theo feels a bit of anxiety. Who wouldn't, with such legendary figures gathered in one room? Among them is Julius Ragnar, the demon dragon and commander of the White Armor Dragon Cavalry. Then there are four of the nine dragons who protect Ragnar. Sky Dragon Ed Troyvan, the Sword Dragon Lady of Plum Blossom Palace, OSA Ragnar, and the Elder Dragon, Head Counselor Wolfgang Ragnar. Seeing all these formidable figures, Theo admits to himself that in his past life, he would have been overwhelmed by their presence. Especially when he notices Wolfgang, the Elder Dragon. Wolfgang has a deep-seated disdain for Theo, and he doesn't even try to hide it. To him, Theo, an illegitimate child, is a stain on the Ragnar bloodline. Wolfgang, with a cold gaze, addresses Theo directly. Are you aware of why you've been summoned? He asks. Without waiting for a response, Wolfgang lays out the charges. The Byron clan, the Merchant Guild, the Red and White Mercenary Corps, and even the Hanavi clan. They're all cutting ties with the main family because of Theo's foolish actions. Furious, Wolfgang calls Theo a bastard, demanding if he can bear the damage he's caused to the Ragnar name. He makes it clear that Theo will be held accountable for dragging the clan's honor through the dirt. But Theo, cool as ever, agrees with him. He calmly admits that, yes, he was too careless. Instead of merely cutting off their arms, he should have cut off their heads. The room falls silent with shock. Theo continues, showing no hesitation. He reminds the tribunal that the other clans, the ones who have now defied Ragnar, are, in fact, the subjects of Ragnar. The Lord has given them land and honor, he says. Their duty is to offer their loyalty and their lives in return. This is the way of chivalry. Theo's frustration rises as he speaks. He tells Wolfgang that if he had known about their insolence earlier, he wouldn't have stopped at their limbs. He would have severed their heads. And now, he believes they should be punished accordingly to restore Ragnar's honor. Everyone is left speechless, 
Even Julius, who's never one to mince words, chuckles, calling Theo's performance impressive. He fully expects that Theo will walk away with a lighter punishment after such a bold justification. But Wolfgang isn't convinced. To him, this is nothing more than mockery, a clever ploy. He's about to challenge Theo when OSA Ragnar, the sword dragon lady, steps in. She admits that Theo is correct. Ragnar may be strong, but it is not truly great. For the Ragnar clan to survive, they must listen to the voices of their vassals and knights. If they only rule by force, they will inevitably fall. Power alone won't hold Ragnar together. It requires respect and loyalty. Wolfgang, clearly surprised that OSA is taking Theo's side, falls silent. He wasn't expecting this turn of events, but OSA's words hit hard. She understands that power isn't enough to rule the world. It's about more than just strength. After hearing OSA Ragnar, the sword dragon lady and first wife of the clan head, Theo is surprised to see her taking his side. She's one of the best swordsmen in the north, and her support wasn't something Theo expected. She emphasizes that the punishment he's about to receive is justified and hopes he understands the gravity of the situation. Theo, staying calm, asks what his punishment will be. That's when Wolfgang steps in, sternly informing Theo that he'll be placed under three months of probation. But Theo doesn't let that slide. He boldly expresses his wish to participate in the awakening ceremony next year. Wolfgang, angered, thinks Theo's talking back, but OSA once again steps in, giving Theo's words consideration and allowing him to participate. This stirs things up, especially for Ed Troyvan, who had been scheming in the shadows. Ed knows that the children Theo injured at the banquet were set to participate in next year's awakening ceremony. Now, thanks to Julius Ragnar's influence, Theo gets off with a lighter punishment. But Ed isn't worried. He sees this as an opportunity. If Theo carries the dishonor from this incident, the Camellia Palace can continue its plan to take over the Rose Palace. He smirks, believing everything is going according to plan, and that Theo is trapped. But then, Theo does something nobody expected. He announces that he wants to appeal the decision. The entire room is left stunned, including Ed Troyvan. Ed tries to suppress his grin, thinking that Theo's arrogance will be his downfall. He's convinced that things are about to get much easier for him. Julius, ever the sharp one, steps forward and asks Theo if he really understands what it means to appeal. Theo responds confidently. He knows it's not something that can be brushed off with just three months of probation. But Theo's not here to settle for a slap on the wrist. In Ragnar culture, appealing means war. Theo states that in the end, only the strong have the right to speak the truth. He's not just asking to defend himself. He believes he should be rewarded for his actions. The room falls into speechless shock. Meanwhile, at the hidden northern branch of the series Merchant Guild, everything is engulfed in flames. Evelyn cuts down the last of the guards as Remington realizes this was the exact hideout Theo had mentioned. They uncover something valuable after destroying the place something that could shift the tides in Theo's favor. Back at the tribunal, Ed Troyvan's eyes light up with joy. He believes his plan is coming together perfectly. Theo's standing before some of the most important figures in Ragnar, and now he's pushing an issue that could have been resolved in three months into a full-blown war. Wolfgang, furious, accuses Theo of arrogance and questions whether he really thinks he can face the forces of 15 clans alone. Theo, Unshaken explains that this is exactly the kind of situation that needs to be handled directly. In their world, power dynamics are everything, and appeals are resolved through proxy battles, a one-on-one -on -one sword fight to decide the victor. The representative of each side fights for their honor. In Theo's case, there's a high chance that the opposing side will send Axion as their champion. Julius, always one to think ahead, recognizes the danger here. He questions whether Theo has a plan, warning him that if he's expecting someone to step up as his representative, he's in for a disappointment. But Theo's not backing down. He requests that the proxy battle take place in one week, as per the rules. Ed Troyvan, thinking he's seen right through Theo's plan, believes Theo is banking on someone like Julius or Evelyn representing him in battle. But Ed knows no one will agree to fight for Theo, meaning Theo will have no choice but to fight personally. Ed, confident in his scheme, prepares to announce Axion as his representative, certain that Axion will easily finish Theo off and show him his place. But then everything stops. Suddenly, the entire room falls silent as they hear someone's footsteps. A voice praises Theo for his cleverness, noting how much he's changed since they last met. Kyle, with an air of authority, and says he's heard all about the situation. 
He knows that Theo is planning to make an appeal through a proxy battle. Theo confirms this, and his father nods, recognizing the difficulty Theo will face if he enters the battle himself. Kyle then asks the big question. Who does Theo plan to choose as his representative? At that moment, Theo realizes his father is testing him. He could ask someone else to fight on his behalf, but Theo chooses to step up, knowing that this is a crucial moment to prove himself. He confidently tells his father that there's no one who can represent him. He will be his own champion in the proxy battle. Kyle Ragnar, impressed but skeptical, believes his son is heading for a loss. But Theo, standing firm, challenges his father's assumption. He argues that no one should come to a conclusion before he's even had the chance to prove himself. Theo is determined to face his challenges head on, unwilling to bend to anyone's will. Kyle bursts out laughing, clearly enjoying Theo's spirit. He turns to the rest of the trial members, asking if they've heard his son's bold declaration. For the first time, the clan head seems genuinely impressed with Theo's unwavering resolve. He praises Theo's Ragnar spirit, the strength to never lower yourself before others. This attitude, Kyle notes, is the very essence of being a Ragnar. Theo, now grinning, feels the momentum swinging in his favor. Things are going exactly as he planned. The proxy battle was never about winning, it was just bait. In the meantime, Theo knows his friends Remington and Evelyn are working hard to dig up the proof of Camellia Palace's treasonous conspiracy. If all goes well, Theo's victory will be absolute, and he won't even need to fight. But then, the clan head throws a massive curveball. Kyle Ragnar, with a serious look, tells Theo he wants to test him personally. Forget the trial. Forget the proxy battle. If Theo can endure a single strike from the clan leader, all charges will be cleared, and there will be no punishment. Theo is stunned. The room goes silent. Kyle's challenge is no joke. A single blow from the strongest man in Ragnar could crush him. Before Theo can react, Ed Troyvan, ever the schemer, starts shouting in protest. He knows that if Theo somehow survives this test, it'll mean the king himself approves of him. That would be disastrous for Ed's plans to take over Rose Palace. Desperate, Ed tries to stop the challenge, arguing about the rules of the proxy battle and how this isn't fair. But Kyle Ragnar shuts him down immediately. The king makes it clear that if a vassal dares to speak against the Ragnar bloodline, they should be removed. Ed, forced to back down, has no choice but to obey the clan leader, though he's clearly seething inside. He glances nervously at Theo, knowing the stakes have just changed. Kyle turns to Julius, the demon dragon, and asks if he has anything to add. Julius, who's been silently giggling throughout the trial, admits he's just surprised to see the king showing interest after so long. The last time Kyle got involved like this, it was for something huge. Finally, Kyle turns back to Theo, asking if he's willing to take on the challenge. Theo, though caught off guard, quickly recovers. He knows this moment has the potential to make or break him. Refusing would make him look weak, but accepting such a blow from his father could be suicidal. Theo speaks up, calling the situation unfair. Not in a way that backs down, but rather to negotiate. He points out that comparing a single strike from the clan leader to a proxy battle between vassals and bannermen isn't exactly a fair trade. The king, amused, asks if Theo is refusing. Theo smirks and responds that he's not refusing. He's simply asking for a fair compensation if he endures the blow. Kyle Ragnar, intrigued, asks what Theo wants. Theo turns toward Ed Troyvan, glancing at him with a look of calculated ambition, and then makes his boldest demand yet. With a cheeky smile, Theo says, I want something like Camellia Palace. The room falls silent once again. Ed Troyvan is left absolutely speechless. His carefully laid trap for Theo has somehow flipped into an opportunity for Theo to shine. His frustration is evident, and as he watches the situation unfold, he can't believe Theo had the audacity to make such a bold proposal to the clan leader. But Wolfgang steps in, calling Theo's demand madness. After all, Making an agreement with the clan leader requires equal standing, and in his eyes, Theo is way out of his league. But what really catches everyone off guard is Kyle Ragnar's response. The clan leader actually agrees with Theo, much to the shock of the room. Kyle sees something in Theo's courage and boldness, traits he believes any future successor of Ragnar should possess. He then turns to the Sky Dragon, Ed Troyvan, asking if he has any objections. Ed, forced to play along, assures Kyle that everything belongs to his lord, so how could he dare object? Satisfied, Kyle orders a stage to be prepared immediately. He wants to test his son personally. 
Theo's nerves start to kick in as he faces his father, while the other vassals and bannermen gather on the sidelines to watch this intense showdown. Ed Troyvan, although frustrated, tries to stay calm. He's convinced that even with Theo's newfound strength, there's no way he can withstand a single strike from the clan leader. After all, not even high-ranking swordsmen can survive such a feat in Ed's mind. Theo's overconfidence will be his downfall. But Theo knows something Ed doesn't. Thanks to the experience elixir he earned after finishing the tutorial, Theo's strength has tripled, and he's confident he can survive his father's attack. The clan leader quickly notices this change in his son and wonders if Theo consumed an elixir, but even that wouldn't explain such a drastic transformation. Still, Kyle Ragnar decides it doesn't matter. What matters is the test at hand. Kyle turns to Theo and asks if he's warmed up. Theo replies confidently, even though the pressure is mounting. The clan leader comments that, normally, he'd use his great sword in battle, but since Theo hasn't learned to use mana yet, Kyle will go easy on him by using a rusty steel sword. He asks Theo if he has any objections, but Theo, determined, says he's ready. And then the fight begins. As Kyle Ragnar's aura flares, the room becomes thick with pressure. Theo feels the sheer power of his father's fighting spirit, and it nearly overwhelms him. But Theo stands his ground. Kyle, impressed that his son hasn't buckled under the weight of his aura, acknowledges that there's something more to Theo than meets the eye. Inside, Theo is focused. He knows his strength has grown exponentially since using the experience elixir. After gaining five levels, he poured all his points into strength, and now he feels like he's finally escaped the realm of the weak and entered the domain of the extraordinary. He's confident he can survive at least a single strike from his father, and that's all that matters. When Kyle Ragnar finally throws his attack, it's like a red beam of light, a massive strike that destroys the entire stage, sending shockwaves through the air. Everyone watches in horror as the dust settles. Ed Troyvan is sure that Theo must be dead, but when the smoke clears, there stands Theo, still alive, though barely. The room falls in a stunned silence. Kyle Ragnar, with a wide grin, is impressed. He's finally found a worthy son. Theo, standing tall after surviving the blow, has proven his innocence through his sheer willpower and determination. The trial concludes, and the system window pops up, revealing that Theo has successfully completed the sudden quest, single strike from Kyle Ragnar. As a reward, Theo receives a mysterious blue key and a new inventory slot. But there's no time to focus on that just yet. Later, Theo wakes up, groggy and unsure of where he is. His mother, Cecilia, is by his side, overwhelmed with relief. She holds his hand and, with tears in her eyes, tells him how worried she was when she learned that the clan leader himself challenged Theo. She asks if he's hurt, offering to call a physician if there are any fractures or injuries. But Theo reassures her that he's fine, though he still doesn't recognize his surroundings. Just then, Julius, the demon dragon, enters the room. He shares some shocking news. By order of the clan leader, Camellia Palace has been vacated. Imali, Axion, and all their loyalists have been removed. Theo is grinning ear to ear as he realizes he's inside Camellia Palace, now fully under his control. The system window updates him, showing that all he needs to do now is uncover the palace's hidden secret to complete the next part of his quest. He's come far, and things are finally falling into place. Meanwhile, in the garden of Camellia Palace, Emil Ragnar, Axion's mother, is causing a scene. Furious at being forced to vacate her own property, she shouts at the servants, who are desperately trying to calm her down. But there's no calming her anger. This is a major loss of power, and she knows it. Watching all of this unfold, Ed Troyvan, who's seething with frustration, quietly gives an order to Axion. He tells him to kill Theo once and for all. Axion, who had been planning something for the awakening ceremony, is taken aback by the sudden command, but Ed's intense desire for revenge is burning. He's not willing to wait any longer. Theo has to be eliminated now. Axion sees the rage in Ed's eyes and knows there's no arguing with him. Back in the palace, after things settle down, Theo is reflecting on the unexpected success of his plan. Even though there were plenty of obstacles, he's managed to secure Camellia Palace without using his trump card, and now he holds even more authority than before. He opens his inventory and casually pulls out an apple. The perks of having this magical system at his disposal never fail to surprise him. He munches on it, marveling at how useful the system has been so far. But there's something more pressing. Theo pulls out the blue key he recently acquired and can't shake the feeling that it's connected to something important. 
As he focuses on a nearby door, the keyhole lights up, and he realizes this is it. He slides the key in, unlocking the door to reveal a deep tunnel. The system chimes in to inform him that he's just discovered his first dungeon, and that all experience gained inside will be doubled. A dungeon inside Camellia Palace? Theo knows there's more to this than just a random underground cave. It must be connected to his quest. Deciding not to miss out on any potential experience, he heads inside. But before entering, he makes sure to prepare, filling his inventory with weapons. As Theo ventures deeper, he comes across a huge wolf, a beast large enough to be classified as a demonic monster. The wolf charges at him with terrifying speed, but Theo is ready. He quickly defends with his shield, but as the wolf pushes him back, he realizes that this isn't an ordinary fight. The wolf's hide is too thick for his attacks to pierce, and its speed is greater than he expected. Theo knows he can't win this fight with half-hearted attacks. He remembers his father's incredible single strike, the devastating attack that nearly obliterated him during the trial. He wishes he could replicate that move and take the wolf down in one blow. But when he tries, nothing happens. He realizes that mimicking his father's strength won't be that easy. It's more than just a single swing of the sword. To land a decisive blow, he needs to put everything into one focus strike. With that revelation, Theo shifts his strategy. He drops his shield, deciding to focus on speed. The sword arts he learned from Evelyn come to mind. As the wolf charges once again, Theo moves swiftly, landing a precise stab into its eye. The wolf howls in pain, taking a step back, and Theo realizes his plan is working. He charges forward again, determined to win this battle. Fast forward two months, and back at the training grounds, Theo's absence has not gone unnoticed. Yodi and Sybil are talking about how the number of people wanting to train with Theo is growing. The rumor about the clan leader teaching Theo a single strike has spread like wildfire, and now, Everyone wants a piece of the action. As Sybil chats about the situation, Henry Morris from Plum Blossom Palace approaches, arrogant and full of himself. Henry addresses Sybil with disdain, calling him a lackey and demanding to know when the incredible young master Theo is going to show up. After all, it's been two months and he's nowhere to be seen. Henry, obviously unimpressed by the rumors, mocks Theo, calling him a coward and insinuating that he's running away from the attention. Henry's taunts continue much to Sybil's irritation. He accuses Theo of spreading false rumors about the clan leader's strike, suggesting there were no witnesses to confirm it actually happened. Henry Morris from Plum Blossom Palace is still running his mouth, assuming that all the rumors about Theo, including the destruction of the scaled dragon society, must be fake news. But Sybil's patience finally snaps. He's had enough of Henry's disrespect, and with all the pent-up frustration from the last two months, he punches Henry square in the face, completely destroying it. Henry's arrogance is wiped clean as his face gets rearranged by Sybil's fist. Another guy from Plum Blossom Palace tries to step in, furious that Sybil would dare touch Henry. He throws insults at Sybil, calling him a dropout, but the tables have turned. Everyone in the training ground, all those loyal to Theo, start glaring at the Plum Palace guy, ready to pounce. Sybil doesn't hold back, he calls him a shit face and makes it clear that no one is allowed to insult their young master Theo. Even Yodi is surprised by Sybil's words, especially since Sybil isn't exactly the prettiest guy around. For him to call someone ugly? That's bold. But Sybil brushes it off, still boiling with rage. He's been annoyed by the Plum Palace guys coming around and causing trouble, and he's had it. There's no way he's gonna let them walk all over Theo's name. Without hesitation, Sybil and his comrades draw their swords and declare war on the Plum Palace troublemakers. The tension in the air is electric, they're about to clash, and it's going to get bloody. The Plum Palace guys, not backing down, draw their own swords. But just as they're about to fight, someone steps in and freezes all the weapons in place with a single move. Everyone is shocked. Sybil, wide-eyed, immediately recognizes him. Ray Ragnar, one of the four hounds of the North. Before anyone can react, Another voice booms with laughter. Hulkus Lanka, also from the Four Hounds, joins the scene, clearly amused by the chaos. Sybil can't believe his eyes. Two members of the Four Hounds have just shown up out of nowhere. Hulkus, always the loud one, starts asking for the Luster Tiger, confusing the Plum Palace guys. Growing impatient, Hulkus demands an answer, clearly looking for the master of the training ground, Theo Ragnar. With a mischievous grin, Hulkus announces that he's here to challenge Theo himself. Meanwhile, deep inside the dungeon, 
Theo is reaching his limit. His sword has shattered, and he's taken on more than he ever expected. The system notifies him that he's leveled up, and multiple windows pop up, showing his stats increasing. He's hunted down 170 demonic beasts, and though exhausted, he sits triumphantly on the pile of monster corpses. But there's still one enemy left, the boss. Theo drinks a healing potion, restoring his strength, and reflects on the brutal fights he's faced. There were many moments when he almost died, but each time, the healing potions saved him. At first, the beast seemed impossible to defeat, but as he leveled up, things got easier. What surprises him the most is how fast time flew by. He's already spent two months inside the dungeon, and it's all come down to this. The system informs him that the final boss is waiting. Theo's sure it's going to be a powerful monster as he spots some stairs leading to the final level. He walks forward, ready to face whatever's waiting for him. But as he looks down at his shattered sword, he knows it won't be of any use. He opens his inventory and pulls out another blade. It's his last sword, one his mother gave him as a birthday present. As Theo grips the ceremonial sword, memories of his past life flood his mind. He remembers how, back then, he had a lot of friction with his mother. Leading up to the awakening ceremony, he had tossed the sword aside, thinking it was useless. He had been too focused on his bloodline, convinced that no amount of fancy equipment would change who he was. He had told his mother to leave him alone, but looking back now, he regrets how he treated her. Not this time, Theo vows not to repeat the mistakes of his previous life. With the ceremonial sword in hand, Theo heads for the boss room. The system warns him to be cautious. A strong demonic beast lies ahead. When Theo opens the door, he's surprised to find a dragon taking a nap. His initial shock fades when he realizes it's just a lesser drake. Still, the sight of a draconic creature makes him wonder. The Ragnars are said to be descendants of dragons. Is this just a coincidence? But there's no time for speculation. Theo knows he has to defeat the boss to complete the dungeon and get out of there. Inside the dungeon, the system flashes Theo the quest details. One more monster to defeat. The lesser drake, the final boss, is a kind of dragon, and it's no easy opponent. Theo steals himself for the fight, but even with his strength, he questions if he can really take down a dragon, even if it's a lesser one. Drawing on his training, Theo focuses on using his technique, the single flash. The movie's practiced endlessly against the wolves in the dungeon. Although it's nowhere near the level of his father's legendary dragon flash, Theo believes that if he uses his dragon heart to the max, he might just land a serious hit. With all his might, Theo charges toward the lesser drake, aiming for its eye. His sword pierces through, and the monster lets out a deafening scream of pain. Theo feels a brief moment of triumph, but it doesn't last. The drake's tail lashes out in retaliation, forcing Theo to dodge. He quickly realizes that his strike wasn't enough. The attack didn't reach the brain. The drake is hurt, but far from defeated. The drake roars, its massive form thrashing, and Theo can sense the mounting danger. The beast is preparing to kill him, but Theo, never one to back down, sees the possibilities in the fight. His confidence fuels him as he charges in again, landing several quick blows. It's not enough to take the monster down, but he's looking for its weak point, the reverse scales that all dragons have. Suddenly, the lesser drake lets out another piercing scream, but this time, the battlefield shifts. The overwhelming fear that radiates from the drake locks Theo's body in place. He tries to move, but fear grips him tightly, paralyzing him. He can see the drake's attack coming, but he's frozen, only able to block it with his sword at the last moment. The impact sends him flying, crashing into a rock wall. Pain shoots through his body, and he knows he can't keep this up for long. Struggling to his feet, Theo spots the drake preparing to strike again. He knows the key to winning lies in hitting the reverse scales, but he needs to be fast and precise. As the monster charges, Theo leaps onto its massive body, dodging its vicious attacks. With a powerful thrust, he pierces the reverse scales. Blood gushes out, and the drake howls in agony. Theo presses the attack, striking the weak spot again and again. Confident his plan is working. But the drake doesn't fall. It's still standing, and Theo's surprise is written all over his face. The beast isn't going down without a fight. Meanwhile, back at the training grounds, the tension between the four hounds is reaching a breaking point. Hulkislanka, fiery as ever, is furious at Ray Ragnar. Hulkus demands the chance to fight Theo Ragnar, but Ray isn't having it. She mocks Hulkus, calling him a loser, reminding him that he lost three years ago. Hulkus defends himself, insisting that he's improved since then. 
He spent every day honing his skills to close the gap, but Ray isn't impressed. She brushes him off, calling him a loser again, which only fuels Hulkus's anger. He challenges her to a duel, declaring that the winner will get the chance to fight Theo. Their weapons clash, and Hulkus swings his massive weapon at Ray, but she blocks it effortlessly, unfazed. The spectators, Sybil and Henry, watch in shock. They don't understand how these two could be so strong. But seeing two members of the Four Hounds go head to head is terrifying enough. Just as they're about to get serious, Remington appears. Remington steps between them, making it clear that this is the domain of young Master Theo, and he won't tolerate any trouble here. Hulkus, ever the warrior, is excited to see Remington and even suggests fighting him. But Remington stays firm, asking Hulkus to respect his words. Then suddenly, everyone feels it. An immense, menacing pressure washes over the training grounds. It's a killing intent so powerful, it makes everyone pause. They all turn to see the source of the energy, and their eyes land on Theo. He's finally arrived, and the air is thick with his overwhelming presence. Even Remington, who knows Theo well, is surprised. He can't help but wonder, what happened during Theo's seclusion? Where did this intense pressure come from? As Theo walks onto the grounds, Ray and Hulkus can barely contain their excitement. The young master, the one they've been dying to test themselves against, is finally here. The entire training ground falls silent as Theo steps into view, dominating the atmosphere with the same fear he learned from the lesser drake inside the dungeon. Back in the dungeon, Theo had managed to land the critical blow. After repeatedly attacking the reverse scales, the lesser drake finally collapsed. The system flashed a congratulations, acknowledging that Theo had successfully hunted the beast. When he touched the reverse scales, the drake went into a frenzy, and Theo had thought he was done for. But, in the end, the drake wore itself out, leaving Theo victorious. After finishing his dungeon quest inside Camellia Palace, the system notifies Theo that he's earned some serious rewards. He's gained the lesser drake's tooth and claw. The tooth is a material for enhancing weapons, and the claw can be used to increase a weapon's sharpness. Theo's immediate thought is to use these materials to repair his mother's sword, a gift he doesn't want to lose, no matter what. The system also surprises him by awarding a new skill, Lesser Drake's Fear. This skill allows him to inflict fear on any target with weaker magic power, which stuns Theo. He had always believed that only a select few could use such abilities. He's thrilled at the opportunity to try it out, but he wonders whether the skill will be useful in Ragnar, considering the place is crawling with powerful people. After finally clearing the dungeon and completing the quest of uncovering Camellia Palace's secrets, Theo receives another reward, a nest compass. Though he doesn't fully understand what it's for, he assumes it'll come in handy for his next quest. He stores it in his inventory and decides to go rest in his room, completely exhausted after the dungeon run. But before he can catch a break, a maid rushes over to Theo, informing him of an urgent matter. She notices his wounds and offers concern, but Theo brushes it off. There's a brawl happening in training ground four, and she needs him to handle it. Theo, not in the mood for games, heads to the training grounds. As soon as he steps onto the field, he unleashes his new skill, Lesser Drake's Fear, and the effect is immediate. The overwhelming aura fills the air, knocking people unconscious as Theo commands them to get lost, declaring that he needs rest. But Hulkus Lanka, ever the battle-hungry member of the Four Hounds, isn't phased. Instead, he's excited by the sheer killing intent Theo is putting out. Without hesitation, Hulkus charges straight at Theo, eager to test his strength against the young master. Hulkus swings his massive sword, but Theo, fresh from his dungeon training, easily overpowers him with just a single strike. The crowd is left shocked, their jaws dropping as Hulkus is knocked back, unable to comprehend how Theo deflected his attack so easily. Theo, too, is surprised by his own progress, realizing just how much he's leveled up since the dungeon. But Hulkus doesn't back down. He's been known as the weakest member of the Four Hounds, not because of his strength, he's as powerful as a black bear, but because he's a bit dull-witted and never rounds out his skills. Fueled by determination, Hulkus charges in again, challenging Theo to block his next attack. Even though Hulkus is known for his raw strength, Theo is now able to keep up with him. With a well-timed slash, Theo counters Hulkus and defeats him in one move. The impact leaves Hulkus coughing up blood before he loses consciousness and collapses. 
Theo realizes that he might have been too reckless with his strength, but he's glad Hulkus is tough enough to survive it. Sybil and the others in the training ground are stunned. They never expected Theo to defeat Hulkus Lanka, the black bear of the four hounds, so easily. As the crowd begins to cheer for the young master, Theo reassures them that Hulkus is still alive, though knocked out. But before Theo can even process the moment, his mother's sword, already battered, shatters completely. It's a moment of disappointment for Theo, as this was a precious gift, but the crowd seems to be cheering even louder, interpreting the broken sword as a sign of Theo's incredible power. Everyone is thrilled by what they've just witnessed. Theo Ragnar has taken down a forehound with just a single strike, and his sword even broke from the sheer force of it. But Theo doesn't quite understand why they're so excited. Meanwhile, as the crowd roars, Ray Ragnar stands off to the side, deep in thought. A memory comes flooding back to her. When she was younger, she had been wandering through the cold and thin clothes when Theo found her. Concerned, he asked why she was out in such freezing weather, barely dressed. Seeing how cold she was, Theo gave her his scarf and took her back to his house, promising to take her home once the snow stopped. As she recalls the memory, a smile creeps onto her face, something she doesn't often do. Watching Theo now, she can't help but feel a sense of admiration for the boy who helped her long ago. As she leaves the battleground, Remington, who's been watching the whole scene, catches sight of her smile, surprised to see such an expression from Ray. Back at Camellia Palace, Theo's feeling a little embarrassed as the maids excitedly congratulate him on earning his new title, Luster Tiger. It's clear his hard work is finally paying off. One of the maids, especially proud of him, advises Theo to keep the momentum going until the awakening ceremony. She believes he can do it, and her enthusiasm gives Theo a boost of confidence. Suddenly, Theo's mother, Cecilia, bursts in, armed with a new abalone dish. Without wasting a moment, she starts force-feeding him, determined to stuff his face with as much food as possible. Theo, caught off guard, tries to stop her, but she's having none of it. As she keeps piling food into his mouth, Theo is reminded of his past life, and a warm feeling fills him. It's moments like these that make him grateful for the second chance he's been given. Between bites, he manages to tell his mother the food is delicious, which seems to please her. But then, Cecilia notices something that wipes the smile from her face, the broken sword. Theo starts sweating nervously, quickly explaining that it broke during training. He's deeply sorry, since the sword was a precious gift from her on his birthday. Cecilia's mood shifts from concern to anger, but not at Theo. She's furious at the person who swore the sword wouldn't break. It was made with white snow steel and ebony steel wood two incredibly rare and valuable materials. Theo, surprised, asks if she means the steel wood from the southern jungles. Cecilia confirms, adding that the materials are incredibly precious, and she's disappointed to find out the sword wasn't as durable as promised. Theo, realizing just how valuable the sword was, is stunned. He never imagined it was made from such rare materials, and wonders how his mother even managed to get her hands on such a weapon. Cecilia, still fuming, declares that she's going to have a word with the sword's maker. And by word, she means she's going to force them to create an even better sword for her precious son. Theo tries to reassure her, saying it's fine and that he can use another sword, but Cecilia won't hear it. She reminds him that people are finally starting to notice his strength and that he needs to be more careful than ever with the awakening ceremony just around the corner. No way is she letting him show up with a shabby sword. Theo, touched by his mother's love and care, can't help but feel grateful. Just as Theo thinks the conversation is winding down, Cecilia tells him it's time to get going. Theo, confused, asks where they're headed. That's when she drops the bomb. They're going to the Basque workshop, the best smithy in all of Winterra. Now, the Basque workshop isn't just any ordinary place. It's one of the top three manufacturing workshops in Winterra, known for its factory-like size and legendary craftsmanship. But what's truly special about the Basque workshop is its master blacksmith, Kersen known as the Elf of Capitalism and one of the few artisans with the title of Master Craftsman. Kirsten's reputation is on a whole other level, and even Theo is shocked. He never expected to meet someone of her stature, and he's immediately curious about how his mother has connections with someone like Kirsten. When they arrive, the first thing Theo hears is Cecilia angrily addressing Kirsten as her mother, catching Theo completely off guard. Speechless, Theo realizes his mother isn't just any ordinary woman. She's the daughter of one of the most renowned blacksmiths in the region. Suddenly, everything clicks. He's quarter-elf, and the reason for his handsome looks finally makes sense. 
Kirsten, clearly not fond of being called mother, snaps back at Cecilia, insisting that their relationship is not that of parent and child. Theo recalls that growing up, he was always told his mother was an orphan with no family. But now, here she is, the daughter of Kirsten, the high elf blacksmith. Cecilia doesn't waste any time. She throws the broken sword down in front of Kirsten, accusing her of making a defective product. Kirsten, prideful and a little insulted, doesn't believe her at first, until she pulls the sword out and sees for herself that it's broken. Speechless, Kirsten can't deny the evidence in front of her. As they bicker, Kirsten asks who wielded the sword. When Cecilia points to Theo, Kirsten's eyes widen in realization. That's the kid behind you, she asks incredulously. Cecilia wastes no time in defending her son, telling Kirsten to watch her mouth. Theo isn't just any kid. He's a genius who will one day reign over Ragnar. Theo, ever respectful, steps forward to introduce himself to the legendary blacksmith. He expresses his gratitude for having the chance to meet her, acknowledging her reputation as the master of the Basque workshop. Kirsten, somewhat surprised by his manners, praises Cecilia for raising such a child. But the conversation quickly returns to the sword. Kirsten asks if Theo was the only one who used the weapon. When Theo confirms, Kirsten is even more intrigued. Cecilia believes the sword was defective, but Kirsten, now realizing this might be more complicated, knows it's going to be a long conversation. She invites them inside to discuss things further, knowing this isn't just a simple repair job. As they walk into the workshop, Theo can't help but wonder about the connection between his mother and Kirsten. Curious, he asks if his mother is really related to the demon craftsman, and Cecilia confirms that he's right. He asks his mother if Kirsten is really her biological mother. Cecilia explains that, although she never spoke much about it, Kirsten took her in as a foster mother for a short time. She shares that Kirsten has a deep love for anything beautiful, whether it's music, jewels, theater, or even people, which is why she took Cecilia under her wing. But Kirsten, ever the gruff elf, cuts them off, calling the past pointless. Cecilia rolls her eyes, clearly not buying it, and Theo notices the affection behind the rough words. Curious, he asks how his mother ended up leaving such a place. Kirsten, with a tinge of frustration, reveals that Cecilia left because of her desire to marry the leader of the Ragnar clan. She never expected Cecilia to willingly walk into such a miserable life, especially with how dangerous the Ragnar clan could be. Yet, to her surprise, Cecilia survived and even returned last year begging her to forge a sword for Theo. Kirsten, always the hard one to please, calls her shameless, which only makes Cecilia more annoyed as they start to bicker. As the two go back and forth, Theo smiles, realizing he's never seen his mother talk like this. It's a side of her he didn't know existed. In his past life, Theo had been so focused on the clan that he never took the time to understand his mother. He was too obsessed with status and power to notice the people who genuinely cared about him. Now, watching them argue, he begins to realize that Kirsten cares about his mother far more than she lets on. He wonders why Kirsten never intervened in his past life. But maybe things are different now. Eventually, they reach Kirsten's private quarters, and as they step inside, she abruptly grabs Theo and shuts the door, locking Cecilia out. Cecilia's muffled protests can be heard from the other side, but Kirsten ignores them completely, focusing her full attention on Theo. Without wasting any time, Kirsten asks Theo a cryptic question. Does he possess the relic of the primordial dragon? Theo, confused, asks if she's talking about the ancestor of the guardian dragon that protects the Ragnar clan. He explains that he's heard stories about the legendary treasures scattered across Winterra for the descendants of Ragnar, but to him, it always seemed like just a myth. Kirsten cuts him off, making it clear that the relics are not a legend. She's frustrated, almost on the verge of tears, as she examines the broken sword. It's a piece she had poured her heart and soul into and it shouldn't have broken, unless it came into contact with something as powerful as a relic. She can't believe the sword failed so easily, and she's convinced that only a relic could have caused such damage. Theo, feeling guilty, apologizes, explaining that the sword broke while he was fighting a lesser drake. He doesn't know anything about relics, but before he can say more, Kirsten decides to show him instead of explaining. She pulls out a casket, sealed tight with chains, and asks if Theo notices anything unusual. Suddenly. Theo's system lights up, showing the familiar blue glow he saw before, just like the door to the dungeon in Camellia Palace. Realizing it's the same energy, Theo asks if it's part of a quest. Kirsten, who can't see the glow herself, notes his reaction and realizes that he's sensing something. 
She explains that inside the casket is a relic of the primordial dragon. She's tried countless times to open the casket, but every attempt has failed. Placing the heavy casket down, she tells Theo the story of the primordial dragon, a being so powerful that it removed one of its own fangs and had it forged into a weapon. This weapon is known as the White Moonlight Blade, a sword said to possess unimaginable power. Kirsten then drops a bombshell. If Theo can break the seal on the casket and claim the relic, the White Moonlight Blade will be his. But there's a catch. If he fails, the consequences could be fatal. The process could end his life and there are no guarantees. She asks him if he's still willing to take the risk. Theo's reaction is immediate. He's smiling, his heart pounding with excitement. The danger, the risk, the legendary sword, it's all part of the challenge, and Theo can't back down now. With a confident grin, he tells Kirsten that the sword is as good as his. The system immediately pops up, revealing the next scenario quest. Be chosen by the primordial dragon's relic, the white moonlight blade. As Theo faces the sealed casket in Kirsten's workshop, the pieces of the puzzle start falling into place. The White Moonlight Blade isn't just any relic. It's the Sword of the Black Dragon, one of the Nine Dragons. Theo remembers the legendary Black Snow Leader, someone who commands fear across Winterra, known as the Black Dragon. Very few know the truth about this sword, and those who've even spoken about it have either vanished or met a grisly fate. Flashes of his past hit him hard. He remembers running into the Black Dragon four years ago, and to this day, he doesn't understand why the Black Dragon let him live. It was sheer coincidence that he even saw the true form of the sword back then. Now, standing before the very relic he once glimpsed, Theo is in shock. How could Kirsten have been in possession of the Primordial Dragon's relic this whole time? Kirsten snaps him back to reality, asking if he's ready to open the casket. Theo, fueled by the desire to claim this legendary weapon, smiles determined to make the sword his own. As he examines the casket more closely, he realizes its design is eerily similar to the dungeon door he unlocked in Camellia Palace. Trusting his instincts, he pulls out the blue key from his inventory and, to Kirsten's confusion, unlocks the casket. As the chains fall away, a strange, ominous light begins to shine from the casket, and suddenly, Kirsten's face turns from intrigue to concern. Before Theo can react, a mysterious black fog emerges, wrapping itself around him and pulling him inside the casket's depths. Theo struggles to break free, but the fog is relentless, dragging him into a mysterious world. When he opens his eyes, Theo finds himself in a place he recognizes but can't explain, Rose Palace engulfed in flames. His memories rush back, and he's shaken by the reminder of how weak he used to be. The fire, the destruction, everything he tried to forget, is now right in front of him. His desire for power overwhelms him, and the vision of Rendon and his enemies resurfaces. He knows he needs to become stronger, strong enough to crush the Camellia Palace once and for all. But then, something strange happens. Out of the flames, a griffin emerges, its piercing eyes locked on Theo. The creature seems to be playing with his mind, feeding on his desire for power, twisting his thoughts. The griffin attacks, ready to devour him whole. Theo, caught off guard, grabs the griffin's beak just in time, realizing that the monster is trying to take over his mind by exploiting his darkest desires. That's when it hits him. This isn't just a regular monster. It's the essence of the Moonlight Sword, a beast meant to test whoever dares claim it. The griffin's voice echoes, calling Theo insolent for trying to challenge its power. But Theo, unfazed, declares that he's already conquered the despair the creature is trying to show him. He's been through too much to be tempted by false promises of power. As Theo struggles, he notices something odd. The griffin is smaller than he remembers. In his memories, the beast stood at least 10 meters tall, but now they're the same height. Theo smirks, realizing that perhaps the griffin's power has waned from being trapped for so long. With a surge of confidence, he tells the monster that the moonlight sword is his now. The griffin thrashes, trying to break free from Theo's grip, but it's too late. Theo's willpower is unshakable, and as he prepares to finish the creature off with a punch, a wicked grin crosses his face. He's already passed the test. Meanwhile, back in Kirsten's room, things are getting tense. Cecilia, who's been watching all this unfold, is panicking. Seeing her son unconscious, she frantically tries to wake him up, but nothing seems to work. Tears stream down her face as she begs her mother for answers. Why is Theo like this? Why isn't he waking up? Kirsten, for once, is speechless. 
She didn't expect things to go this far and admits that she's never seen or heard of anything like this before. She can sense a monster's energy intertwined with Theo's bloodstream, but she doesn't understand how or why. What she does know is that Theo possesses something powerful, another relic, and this is affecting the process in ways she couldn't predict. Cecilia, devastated, warns her mother that if anything happens to Theo, she'll never forgive her. The room is heavy with tension, Cecilia's cries filling the air as she desperately holds her son. Then, out of nowhere, a mysterious light begins to form around Theo's chest. Kirsten and Cecilia both stop, eyes wide in shock. The moonlight sword begins to pulse with energy as Theo's hand instinctively reaches out to grab it. The light grows stronger, enveloping his entire body. Cecilia rushes to her son, trying to wake him up, and when Theo finally opens his eyes, she hugs him tightly, tears streaming down her face. She was terrified something had gone wrong, but Theo, ever calm and collected, reassures her, telling her not to worry. He's completely fine. Meanwhile, the system congratulates Theo for defeating the griffin and finishing the quest. His reward? Becoming the owner of the legendary white moonlight sword. Theo reflects on how lucky he was. The griffin, freshly unsealed, wasn't at its full strength, and its psychological attacks couldn't sway him. It was just a matter of timing. The system then alerts him to something even more shocking. By absorbing the monster energy of the sword, Theo's magic power has skyrocketed now surpassing 200 points and pushing him to the level of a high-ranking swordsman. His body begins to glow with newfound power, but there's a catch. He can't fully use this magic until after the awakening ceremony. Kirsten, visibly impressed by what she's witnessed, congratulates Theo on successfully claiming the sword. But Theo, always the practical one, asks if she's going to keep her promise. Kirsten, with an air of pride, assures him that elves don't lie. However, Theo can't help but notice that the sword seems a bit rebellious. It hasn't fully acknowledged him as its master yet, and this makes him uneasy. Kirsten, ever the sharp observer, explains that the sword's behavior is to be expected. After being trapped for 400 years, the Moonlight Sword is like a caged beast. It's ready to let loose. Theo, a little hesitant, wonders if the sword will ever calm down. Kirsten suggests he take a swing at the wall to let the sword vent some of its pent-up frustration. Theo isn't too sure about the idea, but Kirsten mocks him a little, saying that even with a legendary sword, someone as inexperienced as him couldn't possibly damage the Basque workshop. Feeling a bit unnerved by the challenge, Theo decides to give it a try. After all, this is a chance to test out his dragon heart ability in a controlled way. He gets into position, readying the moonlight sword as its rebellious energy hums through him. As Theo excuses himself and prepares for the strike, Kirsten watches with mild curiosity until things take a drastic turn. With a swing powered by all of his magic, Theo lets loose an attack called Single Flash. The result? Complete destruction. The wall of the workshop, 10 feet thick, splits in half, sending rubble crashing down. Cecilia stands frozen in astonishment, while Kirsten's eyes fill with anxious tears. Contrary to what she thought, Theo didn't just dent the wall. He literally cut the building in two with one swing. And he wasn't even trying to destroy it. Kirsten, watching the devastation, sinks into despair. She's just witnessed yet another costly loss at Theo's hands. First, he broke the sword she crafted, and now he's leveled part of her workshop. Even Theo himself is stunned by the sheer power of the sword, realizing that it drained almost all of his magic in that single, devastating slash. Before he can fully process what happened, Kirsten dashes toward him with alarming speed. She reaches him in an instant, laying a hand on his shoulder and immediately giving him mana to help replenish his strength. Theo didn't even notice her move. She's startled to realize that Theo truly has no control over his magic yet. But after seeing what he did to the wall, she's also struck by his raw potential. This kid is something else, a true genius. A sly grin spreads across her face as she places her hand on Theo's shoulder. She proudly declares that she'll be his patron from now on, telling him to spread his wings and show the world his incredible abilities. Of course, Kirsten isn't just being kind. She's got dollar signs flashing in her eyes. It's clear that in her mind, Theo is about to become a walking, talking billboard for her workshop. If the world sees what Theo can do with a sword from Basque Workshop, it'll bring in massive profits. Theo, ever sharp, immediately sees through her plan. He bluntly tells Kirsten that he can practically see the dollar signs in her eyes, 
a statement that catches her off guard but makes her laugh. She doesn't deny it, she's greedy, but she's also proud to have a grandson like him. And in her own way, she's offering to help him reach even greater heights. As the day winds down, and after destroying half a building, Theo and Cecilia prepare to leave the workshop. Before they go, they exchange a few last words with Kirsten, who, despite everything, seems genuinely impressed with her grandson's strength. It also turns out Theo handed over Drake Fangs to Kirsten as wall repair funds after that accidental destruction of the Bass workshop. Kirsten, being the business savvy elf she is, is thrilled to have this rare material. She's not only impressed with the fangs Theo snagged from his battle with the lesser Drake, but also swelling with pride at how her daughter, Cecilia, raised such an incredible son. Just as she's basking in that motherly pride, a familiar voice echoes in the workshop, addressing her by her infamous title, Demon Craftsman. Kirsten freezes, recognizing the voice. She turns to find herself face to face with the mysterious crow of Ragnar, a man known for his eerie presence and glowing red eyes. He doesn't say much, just simmers with intensity, leaving us on a cliffhanger as Kirsten nervously asks why he's here. Fast forward five days. The much-anticipated awakening ceremony has finally arrived. We find Theo in the middle of yet another sparring session with Evelyn, his one-armed swordmaster. And while they're exchanging blows, it's clear to her that Theo has leveled up. His speed, strength, and precision have all improved significantly. Even the onlookers who've been following Theo's journey are watching in awe and sweating profusely as they realize just how far ahead of them he's gotten. After a solid bout, Evelyn can't help but praise Theo, admitting that he's pushing her back during their spar. Theo, grinning like the cat that got the cream, humbly accepts the compliment, though you can tell he's soaking it up. He never thought he'd hear such high praise from someone like Evelyn, and he's secretly loving every second of it. Evelyn, ever the calm mentor, tells him he's done well, and even hints that he might just be able to become valedictorian of the awakening ceremony. Theo, with a cocky smirk, thanks her and jokingly says that if he does make valedictorian, he'll be sure to mention her name in his victory speech in front of everyone. Evelyn gives him a look, a mix of amusement and exhaustion, wondering if that's even necessary. But Theo's fans? Oh, they're all in. His comrades rush over, eagerly asking him to shout out their names during his speech too. Theo, soaking in the attention, can't help but feel a little proud of his newfound popularity, thinking to himself that maybe being adored by everyone isn't such a bad problem to have. But Evelyn just stands there, giving him a creeped out look, thinking the fame is getting to his head a little too fast. The scene transitions to the central headquarters, where the awakening ceremony is about to begin. Theo walks in, confidently introducing himself as Theo Ragnar of the Camellia Palace. As he enters, he notices the large crowd gathered for this prestigious event. The Awakening Ceremony is the annual event for the Ragnar clan, where young swordsmen finally get the chance to prove themselves and earn recognition, not just among their peers, but in front of the entire clan. Everyone who's anyone is here, big names like the Nine Dragons, and even the former clan head from two generations ago, Hilda Ragnar. Theo spots Hilda and is relieved to see she's still attending these events even though she's supposedly over 150 years old. She certainly doesn't look it, though, and her presence only adds to the weight of the moment. Suddenly, a drum sounds, signaling the start of the ceremony. The conductor, Vanna Ragnar, steps forward, a Dragon Gate swordsman and judge of the event. His booming voice commands everyone's attention as he explains the rules for the preliminary examination. The test is simple but brutal. Grab a sword and make a mark on the steel wall in front of them. Of course, this isn't just any wall. It's forged from a blend of white snow steel, a material so strong that ordinary swords can't even scratch it. But there's a catch. If the participants can open their mana halls and channel their magic into their swords, they'll have a chance to cut through the wall. To help with this, Vanna hands out a special Soma pill to each participant. This elixir contains the power of 10 years worth of magic, designed to open their mana halls and unlock their true potential. The deeper the cut they leave on the wall, the higher their score. Then, Vanna calls out the first participant, Theo Ragnar. Theo steps forward, taking the Soma pill and reflecting on how, in his previous life, his half-brother Axion was the one who took the title of valedictorian. But this time? Not today. This is Theo's moment, and he's ready to rewrite his fate. With renewed determination, Theo grabs a sword and heads toward the white snow steel wall, all eyes on him. He knows this is his chance to prove that he's not the same weakling from his past life. 
As Theo walks toward the white snow steel wall, a system window suddenly pops up, giving him a new quest. Become the valedictorian of the awakening ceremony. With a smirk, Theo knows this is his moment. No more second chances, no more hiding his power. This time, he's here to dominate. Meanwhile, high above the ceremony, Hilda Ragnar, the 150-year-old former clan head, watches with interest. She turns to Kyle Ragnar, the current clan leader, and asks if this is the boy he's spoken of before. Kyle confirms with a slight nod, and Hilda, intrigued by the story she's heard, admits she's curious to see if Theo truly has what it takes to live up to his potential. Back on the ground, Theo, feeling the weight of everyone's eyes on him, stretches his shoulders, trying to shake off the nervousness. The judge, Vanna Ragnar, steps forward and reminds Theo to swallow the Soma pill, which will help unlock his mana hall. Theo pops the pill into his mouth, but he's not the same kid from his past life. Last time, he couldn't control the Soma's power, and it severely injured his Dantian, but not today. As soon as he swallows the pill, Theo feels an explosion of energy within him. The mana surges through his body, scattering in waves. Vanna is stunned, watching this brat cause a mana wave of this size. He's concerned, too much mana can overload a person's system, especially someone with a powerful dragon heart like Theo. But just as quickly as the mana erupts, Theo stabilizes it with ease. Feeling a rush of confidence and power, Theo can't help but smile. It's almost too easy this time compared to his past life. Now, with his mana hall open and the vast power of his dragon heart at his disposal, he's officially unlocked his full potential. No more holding back, Theo gathers himself, leaping into the air, ready to unleash his first true attack. He channels every ounce of magic into his sword, and in a single, powerful flash, a massive dragon made of mana surges forward, slamming into the steel wall. The impact is devastating. A giant crack runs through the wall, leaving the entire arena in awe. Vanna, the judge, is completely boggled by what he's just seen. He announces with absolute certainty, Theo Ragnar has passed. The crowd, bamboozled, doesn't even begin to cover it. Theo's display of power was nothing short of monstrous. A system window pops up in front of Theo, announcing that the curse of bad luck that has plagued him for so long has finally ended. His fame is beginning to spread throughout the world. A wide, genuine smile spreads across his face. He's finally reached the same starting point as everyone else. He's no longer the outcast. As the system continues to update him, it reveals that Theo has caught the attention of some of the biggest names in the Ragnar clan. OSA Ragnar, the sword dragon, wants to take him on as a disciple. Julius Ragnar, the demon dragon, seems a bit frustrated with all the attention Theo is getting, while Robert Ragnar stays cautious. But most importantly, even Hilda Ragnar, the former clan head with the heart of Garuda, has shown interest in him. For Theo, catching Hilda's eye is a huge win. He knows how powerful she is, and secretly, he's already dreaming of obtaining that Garuda heart one day. Things are looking better than ever. But the ceremony isn't over yet. Other participants try their luck with the wall too. One guy manages to leave only a tiny scratch, no more than a thin hairline, and can't help but cry out in frustration realizing how far behind he is compared to Theo. Next up, we've got Ray Ragnar, Hulkus Lanka, and Remington. Each of them puts in a solid effort, leaving impressive marks on the wall, but none of them come close to matching the massive cut that Theo left. Even the crowd can't believe it. These are some of the strongest contenders, but Theo's results have left everyone in the dust. Finally, it's time for Axie and Ragnar, Theo's half-brother and the one who stole the title of valedictorian in Theo's past life. As Axion steps forward, the crowd begins to murmur. People are already buzzing with anticipation, wondering if this year's contest will come down to the Luster Tiger, Theo, and the Dark Tiger, Axion. Axion is furious at the idea that people are comparing him to Theo. It's clear that the crowd's excitement is getting under his skin. Swallowing his Soma pill, Axion's mana surges, and a massive red dragon bursts forth, slashing at the wall with devastating power. The crack it leaves behind is just as large as Theo's, stunning the audience into silence. Even Vanna, the seasoned judge, is left speechless for the umpteenth time today. He announces that Axian Ragnar has passed as well, and the crowd erupts into cheers. Axian Slash was equally impressive, leaving everyone wondering who will come out on top. Now, the final score will come down to precision. As the sun begins to set, 
Vanna steps forward and officially announces the end of the first stage of the awakening ceremony. This year, the results are particularly impressive. There are several participants who have significantly improved their scores. However, the crowd is buzzing with excitement over the big question. Who will be named valedictorian? Stay tuned, because with the first round over, things are about to get even more intense as the Ragnar clan's best and brightest continue to clash. Will Theo claim the title of valedictorian, or will Axion strike back? Either way, it's going to be an epic showdown. As the scene kicks off, we hear this booming announcement. The first stage of the awakening ceremony is officially wrapped, and the results are about to drop. The camera zooms in on Theo Ragnar and his cousin Axion Ragnar, both standing among the participants waiting with anticipation. Suddenly, the announcer calls out, Theo Ragnar. The crowd gasps, and Theo himself? Completely floored. Nobody, and I mean nobody, saw this coming. Theo has been declared the valedictorian of the first stage. The entire place is in shock. And it doesn't end there. The announcer elaborates that Theo scored a perfect 10 out of 10. Every part of his performance, from mastery and technique to magic control and speed, was absolutely flawless. They're calling him Flash Tiger now, and you can hear people murmuring. Did he really beat Axion? They ask. Axion was supposed to be the unbeatable one. But here's the kicker. Theo's sword mark? Nearly identical to the legendary Thorkel Ragnar's record. The crowd is in awe. Now we switch scenes for a moment. Somewhere in the snowy mountains, we see a lone figure walking. That's Thorkel Ragnar himself, one of the top contenders for the clan succession. This guy's a big deal and you can tell he's going to be a key player in this whole thing. Back to the ceremony. The announcer calls out Axion Ragnar's name for second place. That's right. Axion, who also scored perfectly, gets second because his sword mark was just a little shorter than Theo's. And he is not happy. The crowd goes silent as he lifts his head, eyes blazing. The tension is real. While the announcer keeps naming other winners, the focus stays on Axion, simmering in rage. Eventually, the announcer congratulates everyone and drops a heads up. The second stage of the awakening ceremony will be in three days, up in the Winter Mountains, and the 87 examinees who pass better be ready. The scene shifts, and we're now in this cozy little wooden cabin, blanketed in snow. Inside, Theo is celebrating with Remington and a few others, all congratulating him on snagging first place. Theo's grateful, but he reminds everyone that the fight's far from over. The next goal is to ace the second stage together. Theo places a hand on Remington's shoulder, reassuring him. Remington smiles, but you can tell he feels a bit down, maybe even ashamed of his own performance. Theo brushes it off, calling his own win luck and reminding Remington that, as friends, things like that don't matter. It's a touching moment, and Remington feels a spark of determination, joining Theo in a toast to their next stage. Now we cut to the snowy mountains again. Theo is standing alone, reflecting on his victory. Scoring first place, he would have never thought that possible in his past life. But he knows this isn't the end. Winning the first stage over Axion was just a fluke. It wasn't a real battle. His fist clenches as he remembers his true enemies, Axion and Sky Dragon. This is only the beginning. Theo pulls out a strange-looking compass, and a system notification pops up. It's the Nest Compass, which guides him to the direction of the nest. The compass points toward the Winter Mountains, and Theo realizes there's something more to the second stage. Maybe it's going to reveal where this nest really is. Just then, Theo feels someone behind him. In an instant, he vanishes and reappears with his sword at the stranger's throat. The man raises his hands, introduces himself as gets by Jotun from the Gale Sword Unit, and says his captain was impressed by Theo's performance. They're offering him a shot at taking the entrance test for their elite squad. Theo's a little suspicious and asks why he has to take a test if they're interested in him. Gets by explains that even being invited to take the test is a rare honor. Before they can talk further, a voice cuts through the tension, calling Gets by and his group Sword Platoon Fools. Enter Ian So Sorry, Vice Commander of the Black Iron Cavalry, aka the Fire Goblin. She wastes no time, offering Theo a spot in her unit and claiming her offer is way better than what the Gale Sword unit can give. But wait. More representatives from other elite units appear, each one wanting Theo for their own team. It's turning into total chaos as everyone tries to recruit him, and Ian's getting visibly frustrated. Theo, meanwhile, is just watching the whole thing, wondering if he should quietly slip away before this recruiting battle gets even crazier. Right when he's about to leave, another voice echoes through the air. This one's calm and commanding, 
and everyone goes silent. Flower petals drift around as Prunus Ragnar, the Lady of the Plum Blossom Palace, steps forward. Everyone is shocked to see her. She just smiles, saying she's here for the same reason as everyone else, to see Theo Ragnar. And then, we cut to another scene, Axian Ragnar, in a very different light. Furious and out of control, he's slashing and striking at anyone around him in a fit of pure rage. He's completely consumed by thoughts of Theo's victory. It's brutal, and he's not holding back at all. Then his uncle steps in, calmly stopping Axian's sword with just three fingers. Venting your anger like this won't change anything, he says. Axian, frustrated, calls him uncle, and his uncle just tells him to calm down and focus. He leans in and tells him, follow me. I'll tell you how to turn the second stage into Theo Ragnar's funeral. So, just as the dust is settling from all that drama on Theo's side, we see Prunus Ragnar, the Lady of the Plum Blossom Palace, arrive with this powerful stride. She's got one goal in mind, to check out this rising star, Theo. Standing tall, confident, and absolutely radiating strength and elegance, Prunus can't help but question the absurdity of having to impress someone in such a place. Why should a lady of her stature even bother? But, seeing the talent in Theo, she's here anyway, making a serious impression on everyone around. And trust me, the onlookers are losing it. Some of them even think it's a bit of a power play and try to hold her back. But Prunus isn't having it. She lets out a surge of energy that practically hums with power, and the crowd is shocked. They start speculating that she might be creating a separate space just for Theo, maybe even teaching him directly. And sure enough, Prunus and Theo are now standing apart from the crowd, enveloped in this mystical energy. Theo's in awe. He can barely believe he's standing alongside Prunus Ragnar, this legendary figure. She mentions something about the Ragnar Lord possibly disapproving of her being here, but that doesn't faze her. She's determined to give Theo a gift. Theo's a bit surprised, but Prunus clarifies by demonstrating her sword style, which is nothing like the destructive power of Lord Kyle Ragnar. Her technique is all about grace, control, and finesse, and she calls it the Celestial's Flower Rain. She executes an elegant, powerful sword move with a flurry of flower petals, leaving Theo speechless. Theo's blown away, soaking in every bit of the technique he just witnessed. But as Prunus finishes, she reassures him that he doesn't need to master it all just yet. What's important is that he's learned something from her. She leaves him with a powerful burst of energy, inviting him to find her after the ceremony for more lessons. Theo, now encouraged and feeling the weight of her gift, reflects on its significance and the responsibility it brings. Three days pass, and now we're at the Winter Mountains near the Northern Great Wall. The landscape is massive, stretching as far as the eye can see, and it's no ordinary mountain range. The Ragnar clan has protected humanity from the horrors beyond these walls for over a thousand years. This is where the second stage is set to begin. Jackie Ragnar, the ceremony supervisor, steps up to address the participants. He emphasizes that the Ragnar clan has been humanity's shield against the Demon Sea, a cursed land filled with monstrous creatures, and that one day, these apprentices will bear that responsibility. For this test, though, they must stay within the Great Wall. Anything beyond is far too dangerous. The objective? Simple. Hunt down beasts, collect the bells around their necks, and survive in the winter mountains for 15 days. The bells vary in color, with the higher ones indicating tougher challenges. Oh, and there's a catch. Jackie mentions a beast so formidable that no one here could take it down alone. That's right, it's worth major points, but teamwork will be essential. Participants are allowed to go all out, meaning they can steal bells from others. It's survival of the fittest, the Ragnar way. Jackie also shows them a totem for safe zones where they can rest and resupply. As soon as Jackie announces the start, everyone takes off into the mountains. Theo's allies are quick to head into the forest, aiming to secure supplies and help Theo as best they can. Meanwhile, we see a pair of red-haired siblings, Hulkus Lank and his sister, brimming with excitement and ready to jump into the action. And then there's Axion. He's already speeding through the mountains, dead focused, remembering his uncle Ed Troyvan's words. This test could be Theo's final stage. Axion's face is serious, determined to make this mountain Theo's grave. Just behind him is Ray Ragnar, one of the clan's four hounds, watching Axion carefully. Back to Theo, he's about to dive into the forest when someone calls his name. It's Remington, and he's got a lot on his mind. He reminds Theo of their friendship, 
And after days of thinking, he's decided he considers Theo not just a friend, but a rival. He's determined to surpass Theo, and Theo can see that competitive fire in his eyes. Theo smiles, welcoming the challenge, and admits that he feels the same way. They're friends and rivals. Remington's relieved Theo doesn't take offense, and he vows to give his all in this second stage, disappearing into the forest with newfound resolve. Left alone, Theo is feeling pumped, the thrill of the competition sparking a fire inside him. He takes a deep breath, setting his emotions aside to focus on the task ahead. With a steady hand, he pulls out his compass, ready to follow it to the dragon's nest. The compass lights up, pointing the way through the vast, snowy landscape, and Theo's eyes gleam with excitement. Meanwhile, somewhere deep in the mountains, we catch a glimpse of a steep, snow-covered cliff illuminated by a mysterious blue light. It's hinting at something hidden, maybe a secret or a path waiting to be uncovered. So, we catch up with Theo, trudging through the snow in the outskirts of the winter mountain range, muttering to himself. He's following his trusty compass, but he's not exactly thrilled with the situation. It's buried somewhere under all this snow, and he's joking to himself that he should have brought a shovel instead of his prized moon white sword. The sword, known as Griffin, is silent as ever, until Theo grabs its hilt, and suddenly, the blade trembles as if it's alive. But hey, he's got no choice, so he swings the sword with all his might, aiming in the direction the compass is pointing. With a flash of blue energy, snow goes flying everywhere, clearing a path and revealing a hidden trail beneath. As the last of the snow settles, Theo senses someone watching him from the trees. Without missing a beat, he calls out, daring them to show themselves. From behind a tree, a man chuckles and steps forward, asking Theo when he noticed them since they'd been tailing him for quite a while. Theo turns, eyeing the three figures holding swords. One of them, a fat guy, points at his friend, blaming him for being too loud, while the bald one mutters that they're doomed because Theo's even stronger than they expected. The leader of the group smirks and greets Theo, calling him first place in a mocking tone. And Theo recognizes these guys instantly. They're Hai Chow and Loon, known as the Roughnecks of Book Mountain, these aren't just your average thugs. In his past life, Theo uncovered their dirty deeds while working under Hyuxiol. They'd used their missions as a cover to slaughter innocent civilians, leaving behind a bloody trail of carnage. The whole massacre left over 700 dead, with bodies so mangled and heads so crushed that no one could even identify them. Theo had cleaned up the aftermath, and he'd never forgotten that horrifying scene. Remembering this, Theo immediately realizes he'll have to deal with these three sooner or later. He just hadn't expected it would be today. He asks if Axion sent them after him, but the fat guy just stares while the leader scoffs, saying they don't take orders from someone their own age. Theo squints at them, suspicious, and demands to know who did send them. The three thugs move in closer, taunting Theo, saying he couldn't even imagine who's pulling the strings. Then suddenly it clicks for Theo, these guys were sent by the Senate. His guest catches them off guard, and the leader lets out a sly grin, complimenting Theo's intuition. The fat guy, looking a little nervous, asks if they're in over their heads. But the leader sneers, brushing it off. After all, who's going to know once they finish Theo off? Smirking, he draws his weapon and taunts Theo, mocking him about ruining his handsome face. But Theo? He's not rattled. He just calmly draws his own sword. And in a flash, a blue dragon of energy surges from his blade roaring as it charges straight at the Roughnecks. They barely have time to react before a powerful slash tears through the leader. In an instant, Theo unleashes three quick slashes that slice through them like a dragon's claw. Blood splatters across the snow as the three thugs are split in half, their bodies collapsing in a bloody heap. Theo's eyes flash crimson as he gazes down at the severed heads. I don't want to be like you guys, he mutters, leaving their heads intact as a message. Standing amidst the carnage, Theo thinks back to his past life and realizes that maybe these three weren't as strong now as they were back then. Tossing their heads off the mountain without a second thought, Theo then recalls the technique Lady Prunus taught him, the Celestial Flower Rain. He's managed to replicate it three times, but he's still far from mastering it the way Prunus can, executing it with over a hundred strikes in a single breath. He shakes his head, focused on the task ahead, and as he turns to leave, he catches a glimpse of something at the edge of the cliff. Peering over, he notices a hidden staircase carved into the rock below, partially concealed. And just then, the system pings with a hidden quest. Find the invisible staircase and explore the blue cave. 
Without a second thought, Theo leaps down, following the staircase that spirals deep into the mountainside. Meanwhile, back in the monitoring room, things are heating up. A man is holding a scroll and providing updates on the second round, announcing that Axian Ragnar is currently in first place, followed closely by Ray Ragnar. Julius, who's sitting around a large round table, is quick to ask about Theo's progress. The announcer hesitates before revealing that Theo has yet to score any kills or ally himself with anyone. Julius raises an eyebrow, surprised, while the announcer speculates that Theo might be hiding or setting up an ambush. But Prunus, who's also at the meeting, clearly thinks otherwise. Just as she's about to speak, Wolfgang interjects, laughing menacingly as he dismisses Theo's chances in this round. Just because he stood out in the first round doesn't mean he'll stand out here. Wolfgang sneers, calling Theo a coward with zero real-world battle experience. He even goes as far as to mock Theo as an illegitimate child, grinning as he thinks about the roughnecks he sent after him, confident they've already taken care of Theo. Ed Troyven, sitting across from Wolfgang, narrows his eyes, growing suspicious. He telepathically asks Wolfgang if he had anything to do with Theo's situation, and Wolfgang just chuckles, admitting he hadn't bothered to give Ed a heads up. Ed's jaw clenches in frustration, thinking Wolfgang's crazy for acting without consulting him. Inwardly, Ed fumes. Ever since Theo took control of the Camellia Palace, he and his allies had been forced to relocate to the Rose Palace. It had given Ed an opportunity to search through it, but despite all his efforts, he still hadn't found the ancient dragon artifact. He now suspects Theo might hold the key to finding it, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get it from him. Turning to his subordinate, Ed gives a silent, telepathic order to find Axion and tell him to hurry up with a plan to eliminate Theo. Meanwhile, Prunus warns Julius that the Senate must be plotting something in the background and suggests they set up a backup plan. But Julius brushes it off, confident in Theo's resilience. He believes Theo wouldn't just back down, and there must be a reason for his apparent inactivity. Turning to Prunus, he adds, Besides, I haven't forgotten you met Theo behind my back. But Prunus just laughs, brushing him off, saying that what Theo thinks is what really matters here. Now we're back with Theo, who's made his way inside a dark cave filled with skeletal remains. Bones and skulls are scattered everywhere, and as he moves through, the skeletons almost seem to come alive, letting out eerie roars, trying to intimidate him. But Theo's mental stats are sky high, and he's unfazed by these mental traps, barely sparing them a second glance. With a sigh, he places a hand on the cold cave wall and activates his skill, sensory perception. A surge of awareness spreads through the cave as his senses extend, mapping out the paths ahead. And there it is, a glowing path within the cave. Theo's lips curl into a smirk. This must be the hatchling's nest. He recalls a memory from his past life, remembering how Hyuxiol was rumored to have found a legendary item here years later. But this time, Theo's determined to beat him to it. Following the path, he soon approaches a massive, ancient-looking door. Standing in front of it, he can't help but feel a slight twinge of pity for Hyuxiol. After all, Theo is about to claim the prize before he ever gets the chance. Just as he's about to step forward, the door seems to come alive. Behind it, he senses a presence, and then he sees it, a massive eye, wide open and staring right at him from the darkness. So, Theo is standing there, totally dumbfounded as he pushes open this massive door, stepping into the mysterious space beyond. And what's in front of him? It's something straight out of a fantasy novel. Piles of glittering gold, rare swords, treasures from all over the world. But here's the thing. Theo's not drooling over the treasure. He's actually feeling uneasy. This isn't the hatchling's nest he thought he'd find. No, this is something way bigger. It's the lair of the ancient dragon. He takes a shaky breath, a single drop of sweat rolling down his face. He's hit with the reality that if he even thinks about challenging a dragon of this magnitude, he won't stand a chance. Not if he wants to leave this cave alive. All that legendary treasure might as well be miles away. As he glances around, trying to make sense of how he ended up here instead of the hatchling's nest, a thought pops into his head. Did he somehow get faulty intel from Hyuxiel? Or maybe he's just way too early, arriving three years before anyone else? Deciding it's probably best to just leave and regroup, Theo starts to turn away, but then he senses something. His blood runs cold as he feels an intense gaze on him. Turning slowly, he finds himself face to face with a massive, gleaming golden eye, wide open and locked right on him. The dragon's awake. 
Theo stands frozen in place, heart pounding, as the dragon speaks in a voice that resonates through the entire cave, carrying an air of ancient authority. You are the first selector in a very long time, it says. The dragon, lounging calmly atop the mountain of gold, watches Theo intently. Theo can hardly breathe as the dragon goes on, introducing itself as Roadbroke, the very being the Ragnar clan reveres as the guardian dragon and the ruler of Wintermountain. Theo's mind is racing as he realizes who he's dealing with, and overwhelmed by the honor, he drops to his knees, bowing deeply and greeting Roadbroke as his ancestor. Roadbroke, a little amused, tilts its head, echoing, ancestor, with a raised brow. Theo quickly explains, recalling his clan's history. Wasn't the guardian dragon the lifelong companion of their great ancestor Sigurd, the progenitor of their bloodline? And wasn't it also the mother of the famed dragon Friedrich? The dragon lets out a snort, almost sounding amused, and clears up a few things. It seems that bastard Sigurd spread some nonsense, it says. Robroke explains that while it's true Sigurd and the dragon were companions, it was more a bond of respect rather than blood. There was a contract between them, a deep pact, but no romance or family lineage like the tales suggest. After all, a human and a dragon, that's not exactly a compatible mix. Theo feels his cheeks go red at the implication, but he presses on, asking if that means all the Ragnar families talk about having dragon's blood is just propaganda. With a nod, Robro confirms that it's a bit of a myth, but not entirely wrong either. The contract did result in Sigurd carrying traces of the dragon's power, though it was more symbolic than anything. Getting a little more comfortable, Theo realizes he's been given a rare opportunity, something that doesn't require any fighting. He could actually get some answers here, answers that could help him in his quest to rise to the top of the Ragnar clan. Sensing Theo's excitement, Road broke sighs and says that as the Guardian Dragon, it's bound by an ancient covenant. To any worthy selector who passes its test, it grants the right to ask three questions. Theo is practically buzzing now, realizing just how rare this chance is. The scene shifts, and we cut over to Axion Ragnar. He's busy taking down a fierce beast with a powerful technique known as Thousand Dragon's Roar. With one strike, he brings down a tiger-like creature, which falls instantly at his feet. He picks up a small green bell from the creature's neck, smirking and muttering that this makes his 57th. As he tosses the bell to one of his subordinates, he asks if there's been any word on Theo. Orion, a loyal member of Axion's gang, says no, they still have no clue where Theo's hiding. Orion can't help but admire Axion, thinking to himself how strong his leader is, capable of taking down beasts others would avoid. In his admiration, he mutters something about Theo's intelligence, but that quickly proves to be a mistake. Axion's expression darkens, and before Orion can react, Axion grabs him by the throat, lifting him off the ground. With a deadly glare, Axion tightens his grip and growls that true strength knows no fear. Orion, gasping for air, manages to stammer an apology just as another messenger arrives. The new arrival reports that the Central Intelligence Bureau has sent orders to speed things up. Axion releases Orion, still clearly fuming, and brushes off the news, telling the messenger to let the Bureau know that no one wants Theo dead more than he does. His body is practically vibrating with bloodlust, making his intentions very, very clear. We return to Theo, who's deep in thought, carefully planning his questions for Roadbroke. He knows each one has to count, so after a moment he takes a deep breath and finally speaks, starting with what's likely on everyone's mind. Why are you here? Robroke's eye gleams with approval at Theo's choice. Good question, it says with a chuckle. Robroke explains that a creature lies far beyond the edges of the known world, a monster called the Nameless Monarch. For thousands of years, it's been the dragon's mission to protect the world from this entity. Winter Mountain, as grand as it is, is merely an outpost, a strategic point in a much larger battle. Theo feels a shiver as he realizes that even this ancient dragon, one of the most powerful beings in existence, harbors a deep-seated fear of this nameless monarch. But he steals himself, pushing his fear aside to ask his second question. What is the ancient dragon's relic? Roadbroke nods approvingly, impressed by Theo's curiosity. The dragon explains that there are three such relics, each one a powerful artifact connected to the dragon's soul. But, Robroke adds with a hint of mystery, it seems Theo's already in possession of two of them. Theo's jaw drops. Three relics? He quickly recalls that one of these relics is the dungeon in Camellia Palace, 
while another is his white moonlight blade. But what could the third relic be? Roe Broke reveals that the third relic is named Papnir, a result of the ancient dragon soul being split into 31 pieces, each one entrusted to humans to help them guard against the nameless monarch. The relics, Roe Broke explains, can take any form, an item, a weapon, or even a strange occurrence. Theo's mind is racing now, recalling his impossible return to the past, where he'd lived a full 20 years, only to return to his 17-year-old self. Could his strange regression have been caused by Papnir? The revelation stuns him, making him wonder about the significance of these relics and his own miraculous return to this point in time. After a moment, Theo gathers his courage to ask his third and final question. Why was I chosen? Inwardly, he's wondering what makes someone like him, who was once talentless, worthy of facing the nameless monarch instead of others who might be stronger or more gifted. Roadbroke meets his gaze with a knowing look and asks why Theo thinks he's the only one chosen. Theo's eyes widen in shock, his mind racing as he realizes what the dragon's hinting at. Others must have been selected by the relics too. He thinks of figures like Ed Troyvin, Curson, and even the Black Dragon. Did they know about the relics? Did they experience regression as well? Theo feels like he's on the brink of uncovering a much bigger truth. But now he's faced with even more questions than answers. A terrifying nameless monarch an ancient dragon bound by duty, and other possible regressors. The weight of it all settles heavily on his shoulders. Breaking the silence, Robroke announces that Theo's three questions have been asked, and the hidden quest is complete. Now, as per their covenant, Theo will be granted a reward. Theo thinks to himself that he came here hoping for Amon's relic, but maybe he can gain something even greater. A system window appears, congratulating him on completing the hidden quest and offering him the opportunity to claim a treasure. Roadbroke gestures toward the treasure surrounding him, saying Theo can choose whatever he wants, gems, relics, elixirs, skill books, or armaments. Anything he picks will be beyond ordinary imagination. With excitement, Theo's gaze sweeps over the treasures. And with a bold smile, he finally says what's on his mind, surprising even himself. I want you, Roadbroke. Roadbroke is stunned into silence completely bewildered. And that's where we leave it.